Good morning, everyone. Um, I am here to welcome you to the second seminar in a series of four devoted to the topic of uh, Ireland 2030. My name is Philip Roseman. I teach philosophy uh, at Maynooth and am a member of the Royal Irish Academy. I'm going to use the next few minutes to talk a little bit about the fundamental idea which is behind this series of uh, seminars before handing over to my two colleagues who are going to be moderating today's discussion. So as you already know, uh, we're going to talk, we're having, going to have conversations under the heading Ireland 2030. The idea really behind this uh, series of conversations is to create a space for principled reflections um, about the fundamental direction of the Irish society, uh, 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 principled reflection on the world in which we live with the goal uh, to, to not just uh, not make a prognosis about what Ireland might be like in 2030, but kind of um, with the goal to imagine in a creative way what we would like Ireland to be like in 2030. So a space for principled reflection, which is rare these days because of the way in which life has accelerated. And it's accelerated, it's become fast paced. As we all know, I mean, who, hardly anyone is able to keep up with his or her work anymore with the constant flux of emails, the constant flux of tasks. We're, we're in a kind of state of, of, of breathlessness, which makes it very difficult not to be reacting constantly to the latest challenge, political, economic, even military now, but to think about the kind of society we want to live in. In eight years, it's, it's Island 2030 is not far away. So what is this breathlessness, this um, accelerated pace of life due to, uh, which makes it so, so difficult to find simply the time and the leisure to think deeply about the way in which we want to live? Well, on the one hand, we have in the last few years been faced by a kind of never ending series of very serious challenges, um, Brexit, COVID, against the background always of the, of the conversation, of the rising threat of climate change. And now, just recently, um, we have a, a war on the European continent. So it's not surprising, one would hardly blame politicians for constantly being in a kind of crisis resolution mode, uh, because that's what they have to do. So there's little time for principled thinking. But it's not just that in the last few years, since um, whatever, since Brexit, we've entered into this period of acceleration. It's rather that the modern age really since industrialization, since at least the 19th century, has been characterized by a constantly accelerating pace. And that for a number of reasons that um, have to do, for example, with uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure of transportation and communication. Just compare, um, imagine now the way in which uh, someone transported a letter in the medieval period from even Dublin to London. Well, that took you know, I mean, at least a week, you know, you get on your horse back, you take the boat, you know, you ride the horse then from whatever port to London. So today it's instant. I can communicate not just with London, but with Hong Kong and with New York, uh, you know, in a second. Um, which has had, for example, significant implications for the financial markets. Um, you know how the stock markets have been influenced by the existence of algorithms which trade automatically. So an acceleration that already on some occasions has gotten out of control, leading to near crashes of the stock market. But there are other, so there are these developments in the areas of, of transport and communication that have occurred. But there's another dimension that bears pointing out, and it has to do with the with the it, it, it gives something like the fundamental reasons for the problems we're facing in relation to climate change. Uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have started depleting very rapidly deposits of fossil fuel, which it has taken the Earth up to 650 million years to produce. So the kind of coal, gas, and oil that we're bringing to the surface now in record time within a, a, a couple of centuries and then very much accelerating the 20th century and still in the 21st, we are uh, exerting an influence on earth time, which accounts for the fact that uh, we, we are now facing this crisis because we are 
uh, undoing natural processes, not slowly, you know, harvesting a little bit of peat here and there, but at this extremely rapid pace with which the earth is no longer able to keep up really. Mm, so that is a kind of perspective of um, uh, an attempt to explain acceleration, which comes from a consideration of our, uh, our relation to the past. Um, another consideration concerns the future, and that has to do with the way in which the credit economy accelerates economic life. Um, since uh, investments in the capitalist economic order are based on credit, it is possible to um, undertake economic transactions on the promise of production and work uh, that lie far ahead in the future that have not yet occurred. Um, a corporation can take out a credit for profits that they expect to um, generate within the next 50 years, which then again leads to an acceleration of economic life because we are anticipating the future. Just as we are compressing the past, we are anticipating the future. Um, if you're interested in these philosophical ideas, there is a philosopher who has written extensively on acceleration, Paul Virilio. Um, and uh, among some German sociologists, people like Hartmut Rosa, there's also in the last few years been considerable reflection on precisely this phenomenon of the compression of time, which I was trying to uh, describe just a little bit right now. So the bottom line is we are breathlessly uh, running behind developments um, that we are no longer uh, that we are no longer able to um, keep up with intellectually. I mean, if you take the area of technology, technology is always ahead of us, and we have to reflect on ethical challenges that that arise after you know they have already occurred. So then that raises the question: How human agency is still possible? And perhaps that's a slightly abstract term. Human agency was, but is that even well the ability to shape our lives as opposed to being shaped by events and developments? And again, I've made this point now several times. I think it's clear. Um, we, we, you know, we, we are in the situation where we're increasingly shaped by the conditions of life that surround us, um, trying to address challenges as they arise without being able anymore to shape our future. And so, that's the, that, so therefore, Ireland 2030 is an attempt to step back for four mornings, four Wednesday mornings in the month of May, and to reflect on these challenges, and again, not simply in a reactive mode, but in the mode of in a more creative mode, in a more imaginative mode, with the idea of thinking about suddenly the challenges, but also what a humane life would be like in Ireland in 2030, how we want to live, not simply how we are compelled to live by current events. This series of seminars um, is the fruit of a collaboration of two committees within the Royal Irish um, Academy. The committee, uh, it's called EPLP, Ethics, Legal, Political, Ethical Studies, Legal, Political, Philosophical Studies, I think is what the committee is called. I actually serve on it, so I ought to know its name properly. Um, and the EPLP committee is collaborating with uh, Koshte, uh, Jan Nagwelge, so the Committee for the Irish Language and Culture uh, and Literature, uh, and we have collaborated on making, making um, this series of four seminars a reality. A big thanks, therefore, to all the colleagues who have contributed to this series of events and who are either um, going to be actively present, if you will, in the foreground, but there are also many people who have been in the background organizing things, uh, liaising with colleagues, networking. I should also mention uh, Vanessa Carswell of the Royal, Royal Irish Academy, who has invested an enormous amount of time and energy into making this series of, semin series of seminars a reality. Um, so uh, last week, we, uh, the, the seminar was addressed to the topic technology and Irish culture. Today, we're going to uh, talk about digital citizenship and governance. And um, my um, camera is going to shut off in just a second, but not um, before I introduce my two colleagues who are going to be chairing today's session. Uh, these are Dr. Birgit Schippers, um, who uh, taught in Belfast for a long time, but just recently took the boat uh, over the Irish Sea and is now at the University of Strathclyde, um, where, the is, where she is in the law department. Um, she works um, on the 
legal and ethical dimensions of the deployment of technology in the public space. So for example, she has, has some very interesting publications on the ethical and legal implications of the, of the use of drones. Um, so that's our first um, moderator, if you will, this morning, Dr. Birgit Schippers. Um, Professor Hinton de Bruin teaches modern Irish uh, and is my own colleague at Maynooth University. And um, his major area of research as reflected in, um, uh, in a major book that he published just a, just a couple of years ago um, is the question of revivalism in modern Irish literature, but his interests go beyond that. With that, I hand over to my colleagues. Um, thank you for your interest in this series of seminars. Uh, and I hope that you uh, will find the conversation this morning to be of value and interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip, for your uh, kind words and for your uh, introductions. Um, I'm Dr. Birgit Schippers from the Law School at the University of Strathclyde. And on behalf of myself and my colleague, Professor Fintan de Bruyne from Maynooth University, I wish to extend a very warm welcome to our panel speakers this morning, but also to everybody who's joining us online. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, I want to just say a few words about um, today's events. As Philip already uh, outlined, uh, this morning's session is part of a series on the topic of Ireland 2030. And when we were preparing and planning the event series, we kept returning to a question, uh, which is that of human agency of how we can shape, how we can govern, how we can imagine our individual and collective lives. And this question, of course, takes on a particular urgency and poignancy as human interaction is increasingly mediated by digital technologies and as public services and public decision-making, for example, is, is shaped, is governed by, by algorithms, and as democratic discourse navigates a, an environment which is saturated with disinformation and with the global reach and also the local power of big tech corporations. Now, of course, we don't want to be Luddites. Um, we are here today because we want to challenge ourselves and each other to explore how we can harness the benefits of digital technologies whilst also reducing harm and risk and how we can defend and in fact strengthen uh, democratic citizenship, democratic governance and also human rights in the age of smart technologies and surveillance capitalism. Thankfully, we have a, an excellent lineup of speakers with us this morning who will address some of these issues in their presentations and who can draw on their distinguished contributions to areas such as data protection, privacy, artificial intelligence, the media, digital rights, and also surveillance. So just to briefly outline the structure of this morning's events, we have event, we have two panels. Uh, each speaker will present for approximately 25 minutes and we will then have 10 minutes for Q&A. And I would really encourage uh, the audience to post their questions into the Q&A function. We'll take a short comfort break at around 11.30 until 11.45, when we return for the second session. And we intend to conclude today's event at uh, one o'clock. So without further ado, uh, please let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Orla Linsky, who is Associate Professor at the London School of Economics and also a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Bruges. Dr. Linsky researches and teaches data protection, technology regulation and European Union law. She holds law degrees from Trinity College Dublin, from the College of Europe Bruges and from the University of Cambridge, where she's currently a visiting researcher 
working on synthetic data and separately on data protection enforcement. Dr. Linsky is author of The Foundations of EU Data Protection Law, published with Oxford University Press, and is currently working on a textbook on EU data protection law, also for Oxford University Press. She is a member of the Modern Law Review Editorial Committee and editor of the International Journal of Data Privacy Law. The title of Dr. Linsky's presentation this morning is Accountability and Effective Remedies in the Digital Society. You're very welcome, Dr. Linsky. Um, many thanks and, and thank you to the Royal Irish Academy and, and Dr. Shippers and Professor De Bruyne for, for the invitation to speak this morning. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. So um, in thinking about the, the questions that were posed for this panel, in particular, this question of whether or not we can minimize um, the risks of te the technology and technological systems might pose for uh, democratic citizenship while maximizing the advantages. Um, in, in, in thinking about that, I think a, a key element is um, through protecting uh, fundamental rights and ensuring that there is respect for the rule of law. So actually this morning, what I plan to talk about is enforcement of legal frameworks in the digital society. If we look at the various challenges for fundamental rights that we see emerging as a result of um, technological systems, so a lot of these I think are, are kind of data-driven data challenges arising from the more granular processing of personal information to make decisions and to influence people through content moderation and, and various other means then we see that there's been a, a real glut of laws enacted recently, in particular at EU level. So I, I very much um, empathise and, and understand that kind of breathlessness that was mentioned in the introduction. If we look at EU level, we see that we've had recently um, a Digital Services Act, a Digital Markets Act, an AI Act, many of which I think um, subsequent speakers will, will discuss the, the substance of. Um, but in fact, although we've had this um, raft of new legislative instruments proposed and um, building on top of existing legislation like the GDPR, the enforcement of these instruments um, has been a bit of an afterthought. And um, more generally, I think the question of how do we, um, how do we ensure that they are, they're effectively enforced, but also what do we consider to be effective enforcement? What would be the benchmark for effective enforcement of these systems uh, in the digital society? So that's the, the kind of overarching topic of what I want to talk about this morning, if I just um, share my slides. So I'm looking at accountability and effective remedies in the digital society. And the, the context here, and the context um, I kind of assume in, in my work, um, makes these, these kind of three assumptions about the technological and societal reality that we live in. So the first is that um, our interactions, whether they are professional, administrative interactions with the state, social interactions with our friends or, or colleagues, um, that these are increasingly digitized and therefore we collect more data than was previously the case. Even I think our Zoom call this morning probably illustrates that quite nicely. There are more data points collected about us, both directly, our, our email address and others, but also um, indirectly, inferences about us, how interested we are in a particular topic in terms of our engagement with the screen while, while the presentation is occurring. Those types of data points are now possible to collect. So we have more data than was previously the case. We also notice that our interactions are often intermediated by digital platforms. Again, um, that's the case this morning through Zoom, where a speaker could be blocked, for instance, if uh, making kind of inappropriate comments. Um, but more generally, if we think of something like um, the use of uh, contact tracing apps during the pandemic, we know that the, the big digital um, platforms uh, for mobile phones, so Apple through its um, App Store and Google through the Google Play Store, place constraints on states uh, concerning the types of data that could be collected for contact tracing purposes. So we have private actors 
intermediating between us and those with whom we are attempting to engage in some form of, of communication. And public authorities are becoming increasingly reliant on these private um, actors in various ways. And so I think from a, from a legal and a societal perspective, this represents um, a, a bigger kind of rupture between um, the public and private than was previously the case. There's no longer this clear distinction between public and private. We have a kind of emerging of the public and private spheres in a way that um, isn't yet fully recognized, I think, by the law. And then the third assumption I'm working off this morning is that data is power. And I've written about this previously in a, in a paper about data power. But essentially, um, the idea here is that those who have access to more granular information about individuals and about groups will be able to exercise power over those individuals and groups. And this granular data, granular data processing renders individuals and society more transparent. Um, and as a result, exacerbates asymmetries of power between those who have access to this data and who process those data and those whose, whose data are processed. And I think in some ways, these three um, assumptions are, are nicely illustrated by the discussion that we've seen in the past um, week or so in the US following the leakage of the draft Supreme Court judgment um, overturning Roe and Wade on, on, on abortion rights, um, where in the US, a lot of the discussion has subsequently been on data processing by menstrual tracking apps and how that, that data trove could be used by um, states where there are, um, there are restrictions on the rights of individuals to access abortion services. And so you can see here that that's a new data source that will be available. It illustrates this breakdown of public and private um, divides. You know, a private operator might be able to provide these data to the state. And that allows for new forms of control and, and coercion over individuals as a result of access to that type of granular data. So that's the, the, the context in which we're operating, I think. Um, so what then can we say about enforcement of rights in this context? Well, this morning I'm going to focus in particular on data protection, because that has been the kind of go-to legal framework when we think about responding to these technological and societal changes. And I, I've chosen data protection for a few reasons. You know, it is this go-to framework. It's one of the more established legal frameworks in the EU. Um, of course, from an Irish perspective, in, in terms of the way in which the enforcement framework for data protection works, the primary enforcer is um, the regulator in the place of establishment of the data controller. So for big tech, um, a lot of the big tech companies are established in Ireland and therefore our, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, the DPC, becomes the primary site for intervention into an investigation of um, data processing operations. So what do I want to say about effective enforcement? Well, I think the key issue is that we don't yet have um, a benchmark against which to assess whether or not enforcement of our legal frameworks is effective. So you see this, I think, nicely in the quote here from the Irish Data Protection Commissioner in its 2021 report. The volume of work is ever intensifying, but what has remained elusive is any agreed standard by which to measure the impacts and success or otherwise of a regulatory intervention. And I would say beyond this kind of absence of um, a, a concrete benchmark, what we're also missing is um, an agreed assessment of what we would consider to be effective, what kind of optimal balance of rights and interests we want to achieve in the digital environment. And I think that when you look at um, the enforcement of the data protection regime so far, keeping in mind that um, this might indicate to us how effective the enforcement of these new frameworks that are coming into play, like the Digital Markets Act or Digital Services Act might be. We have, um, well, I've identified five ambiguities here, primarily for reasons of time, but I think we could identify many more. 
So we have open questions that are both intensely practical, but also conceptual. So for instance, would we say that effective uh, enforcement exists uh, even if we are not protecting the rights of all individuals? So um, can effective enforcement be equated with the protection of individual rights? Um, what harms do we want our legislation on data protection or AI um, to address? And in the absence of an articulation of these harms, is it possible to have a kind of a risk-based approach to um, these legal frameworks. I'll go through each of these points in turn. So the first key um, unresolved issue, as I see it, is uh, a bit of a, a tension between, on the one hand, the idea of effective enforcement, and on the other, the rights of individuals to have their complaints addressed in a given context, acknowledging that um, that if we see data protection and privacy as fundamental rights, then individuals should be able to have these rights upheld before regulatory authorities and eventually before courts. And here, if you look at a legal framework like the competition law framework, which exists to uh, remove competitive uh, interferences, or interferences with artificial interferences with competition in markets, we see there that competition regulators are um, endowed with a, a kind of a public power to enforce the law in um, a, a kind of a public way. What do I mean by that? They have complete discretion as to what um, initiatives they will investigate and what actions they will not investigate. And individuals are nowhere found in this picture. They may be granted um, the opportunity to participate in competition proceedings, but there's no right to participate in competition proceedings. In that sense, it's a purely public enforcement framework. Um, however, what we see in, the, in, in other acts and other legislative instruments around digital society is that their aim is to protect fundamental rights. And so if you look at something like the EU AI Act, its aim is explicitly to protect fundamental rights in the face of the use of um, AI systems that impact on individuals and society, high risk systems, and you know, there's a risk categorization. However, that legislative framework does not give any direct rights to individuals. They are entirely excluded um, from direct action under the framework. If you look at something like data protection law, we see that we have independent regulators there to effectively enforce the system, but also that we have these rights given to individuals to um, make claims before these regulators to uphold their rights. However, what we've seen in practice is, um, you can see this kind of on the one hand, um, that regulators, and here I, I quote from the DPC in Ireland, but this has been the case for other regulators across Europe, has said that they will apply a risk-based um, regulatory approach to their work so that their resources are always prioritized on the basis of delivering the greatest benefit to the maximum number of people. They sum this up by saying they want to do um, more for more. But this means inevitably that some complaints will not be investigated and, or, or at least investigated to the extent uh, requested by individuals. And so contrary positions have, for instance, been taken by um, prominent commentators. So for instance, here you say, you see uh, Hilke Heimans from the Belgian Data Protection Authority say that data protection agencies are free to set their own agenda, but with one limitation, which is their obligation to handle complaints. Equally, you see the Court of Justice of the EU insist upon the effective and complete protection of individuals. And it, um, in a separate judgment, indicating that data protection authorities are required to exercise their responsibility to ensure that the, the general data protection regulation is fully enforced. So we have this open question about what constitutes full um, and effective enforcement. This I think is very much linked to the question of what remedies should um, authorities use in order to guarantee our rights in the digital society. So again, you see here from this judgment, the Schrems II judgment from the Court of Justice, 
that um, it states the primary responsibility of data protection authorities is to monitor the application of the GDPR and to ensure its enforcement. But what do we mean by enforcement? There are a lot of options here. We might simply have an, an engagement between regulatory authorities and their stakeholders, something that has been highly criticized because it could lead, of course, to regulatory capture of, the, of these data protection agencies. We have in the Irish law um, the explicit possibility of amicable resolution of complaints. Um, query whether or not amicable resolution can be, um, whether or not a complainant can reject this possibility of amicable resolution. And then you have others who say that the fines that are foreseen by a law like the GDPR um, are, uh, are, are, are effectively required. So David Erdos here at the University of Cambridge um, says that the GDPR establishes a presumption that data protection authorities will issue these fines or at least take formal corrective action. But we've seen um, a relative lack of fining or reluctance to fine on the part of a lot of authorities. And finally, I think perhaps most importantly for the protection of um, citizen and resident rights um, in the context of personal data processing, we've seen a real reluctance on the part of administrative agencies to directly target business models. So um, I think a great example of this is the, in the context of online behavioral advertising. Uh, so in, in November, Dr. Ryan, who'll speak later, and myself gave evidence to the European Parliament on online behavioral advertising and the need for a ban, a legislative ban at EU level on this type of surveillance based advertising on the grounds that um, this type of advertising, which is not the only way in which you can target ads to individuals, is disproportionate. It requires the processing of extremely sensitive data points. Um, around mental health, around substance abuse, around very sensitive issues in order to simply present ads to individuals. However, the Parliament didn't enact um, a full-scale ban in part because it considered that this issue could be dealt with by data protection law. Yes, we have this vicious circle because data protection regulators are reluctant to in intervene in a very kind of um, robust way to target business models because of the economic um, and other implications that this will have. And so we don't yet know what effective remedies constitute. Another issue concerns the harms that we want to address through legislative instruments like data protection, or indeed, I would say now the AI Act. And Karen Young, um, in a great article entitled Why Worry About Decision Making by Machines, um, notes that the GDPR um, contains references to harms. For instance, the idea that I as an individual could go to court and sue um, an entity that processes my data for damages before the court, even where the harm is an intangible one. Um, so where it's not a physical harm. So we have this possibility in the law, but we don't really have any kind of definition of harm. And so she queries um, whether our concerns um, and our concern with risk should be understood as potential harm or damage, uh, you know, which is the usual um, focus of legal instruments, or are we concerned more broadly with potential wrongs understood in terms of violations of legal and fundamental rights? And so we could think, for instance, of situations where um, a harm occurs without a wrong. Um, you know, so if I um, accidentally swat somebody in the face, <laughs> I might not have intended to do so, but I might cause harm. But equally, we can think of wrongs, um, a large scale data breach, for instance, that that might not cause a harm. And so we have um, a situation here where the law doesn't really uh, doesn't really define or interrogate what, what it is precisely we are seeking to protect. And this, I think, becomes um, more apparent when we start to think of technological developments like things uh, such as synthetic data. Synthetic data being artificially generated data that replicates 
some of the properties of real data, let's say my personal data. And this type of data could be used um, just as my personal data could be used to make decisions about me or to influence me in some way. This type of data can be used with the same um, outcomes. Yet we have a, an open query about whether or not a framework like the data protection framework, because of its focus on personal data, um, whether something like synthetic data, artificially generated data, could fall within its remit. And I would say if you, if you think of the harms, um, take a, a kind of a broad harms-based approach, the answer would be of course, but this isn't clear um, from the legal framework itself. And then finally, um, and sorry for the jargon here, um, but I think a big issue um, that will need to be addressed before 2030 certainly concerns what I'm calling new administrative constellations. So EU law generally um, is applied in a decentralized way. There is no overarching European public administration that reaches into each EU member state and applies EU law. Rather, what we know is that it's the public bodies in each state that enforce EU law um, in a spirit of, of sincere cooperation with the EU, with the, with the, with the backup <laughs> option of sanctions if the member state doesn't enforce correctly. And this has worked relatively well so far, this, this, this decentralized system of administration. But what we're seeing in the digital um, rule book and in particular, if you look at the GDPR, is what has been labeled a diagonal multi-jurisdictional composite procedure, which is as complicated as it sounds. So the idea here is that you have regulatory bodies at national level, like the DPC in Ireland, who are responsible for enforcing the law, including in, in transnational contexts, but where, and, and in order to do so, they cooperate with their peer agencies across Europe. So the Irish DPC will cooperate with the German data protection authorities or the Swedish data protection authorities or the Polish ones in a network. And where there is a dispute um, between these agencies, this is kind of kicked up to European level where we'll have a European level decision. So public, um, public lawyers, EU public lawyers have noted that the creation of this type of complex procedural construct, and I quote here from Hervik Hoffman, can only be explained by a lack of awareness of requirements of protection of individual rights and supervisory necessities. Why? Because these systems are so complex that if a decision is taken that involves an Irish resident, um, a Swedish resident, a Polish resident and a German resident, even though those decisions about, let's say, the data processing operations of Meta are communicated to the individuals by their home authority, we might see then a raft of parallel appeals ongoing at European level in a way that really frustrates the rights of individuals to get an effective remedy. Because in order to really get a, an effective remedy, you might need to tour the courtrooms of Europe or to take action at, at domestic level and at EU level. And so there could be a ratcheting up of cost and complexity here for individuals in a way that really hinders um, the right to an effective remedy. Finally, um, we have a, a query here about the more the merrier, what I'm calling the more the merrier enforcement. There's no um, hierarchy or prioritization in terms of digital enforcement between public enforcement by these regulatory agencies and private enforcement by individuals or um, between different, uh, different authorities that might pounce on the same problem and see issues from their, their distinct perspectives, like a consumer protection authority or a data protection authority. I can discuss that more in questions if helpful in the interest of time. So just some final observations. I would say here that we, we have this raft of new substantive laws to protect our fundamental rights and ensure the rule of law in the digital environment. However, these alone will not be sufficient to safeguard individuals. We need to have um, enforcement. And enforcement here is often an afterthought in these legislative instruments. And in particular, we see that big questions about the optimal balance between public and private enforcement, 
about the aims of the legislative and framework frameworks are they about deterrence are they about behavior change are they about delivering um rights uh, and delivering remedies to individuals these haven't been kind of thrashed out nor has um the kind of frictions uh between relevant stakeholders been been thrashed out properly so um although we've, we've we've had some really significant and important developments in terms of substantive law i think um a big issue for for the coming decade will be how we can actually deliver on these substantive laws in a way that um, respects the rule of law. Thank you very much, Ola, for a uh, excellent presentation, which uh, I think really set the con sets the context for the discussions this morning. So we, we heard about the challenges uh, uh, that, uh, that exist for, for, reg for a regulatory design uh, for, for establishing what, what counts as, as effective regulation, uh, conceptual as well as, as, as legal benchmarks that, that are meaningful and, and that can be uh, implemented, that facilitate um, effective remedy and, and also, uh, you know, given, given the, the focus on, on a European regulatory framework, how we can how we can get remedy and how we can enforce data protection law across different different jurisdiction and in the context of this this wonderful phrase the diagonal multi jurisdictional composite procedure so uh let me see uh if we have uh any questions coming up in in the uh chat uh if if uh, I can encourage again our uh, participants to, to pose their questions, uh, but maybe I'll uh, use my, my position as, uh, as convener of this, this first panel this morning to ask the first question. Um, one of the things that uh, intrigues me and, and that, that I'm grappling with is how, how we can regulate technolo te technologies that are constantly in flux. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, synthetic data, and I know this is one of your 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 research interests at the moment. So, how do we reconcile, uh, or how do we bring together the the already existing challenges of of developing an effective uh, uh, enforcement regime with with the added challenge of dealing with with the pace of technological development? Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a that's a very challenging question, I think, um, and and something that tech, lawyers interested in technology regulation have been kind of grappling with for for many years. Um, because the argument it's a kind of a Goldilocks argument. The argument goes that if you intervene in in technological change too early, then you you potentially stifle innovation. Um, whereas uh, if you leave it too late, then the the horse is bolted and it's it's difficult to intervene in an effective way. I think um, a, a big uh, query here is what, to what extent we allow <laughs> for technologies to uh, be placed on the market that are simply not in compliance with existing legal frameworks. And I think we've seen quite a lot of this in recent years. If I think about it from a data protection perspective, for instance, um, a technology like blockchain, um, which is you know this kind of distributed ledger uh, uh, where individuals can contribute and where the, I think the key point is that the, the contributions to the blockchain are immutable, so you can't delete them. There's a fundamental clash between that idea that you can't delete data on the blockchain and something like the right that you're given in EU law to delete your data. <laughs> and so it's simply impossible with this technology to deliver on the right. And I think there are kind of two ways of, uh, lawyers have been uh, kind of conceptualizing this. One is to simply say, this is illegal because um, you can't deliver on the right at all. The very essence of the right <laughs> um, is rendered redundant because it doesn't exist. You can't exercise it and simply call it illegal. What we've seen from the Court of Justice, I think, is a more um, diplomatic dance um, where it says that data controllers need to comply with the law to the extent possible 
within their powers, responsibilities and capabilities. Um, and that that language, which has actually gone overlooked, I think, in a lot of the legal doctrine to me is 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 potentially problematic because it means that you can design a technology in a way that it is not rights compliant and then simply say, well, it's not within my powers or capabilities <laughs> to comply with the law. And actually, the context in which that language was first used was um, in the in the in, in cases about Google's search engine and whether or not the search engine could be compatible with the prohibition on sensitive personal data processing um, because it automatically, let's say, um, processes information about criminal convictions. And you could see that the court there was, was facing the reality of either declaring Google search engine, <laughs> the business model as such to be illegal, <laughs> or coming up with this kind of formula to allow um, some sort of ex post um, exercise of rights but allowing the business model to exist in the first place. So I, I, I don't think we have a, a one firm answer to, to that question, but you can see the way that courts are kind of maneuvering around it. Yeah, absolutely. I can see, oh, uh, there's a question uh, coming in. Could I ask the audience perhaps to uh, just keep, uh, keep posting your questions? So um, one question um, is, um, Another one about uh, synthetic data and inferences. How can people assert their rights when synthetic data, uh, which is not personal, uh, protected data is used to make inferences, um, sorry, inferences, um, which then impact on, on, on a person as, as an uh, individual? Uh, is there also a legitimate concern that synthetic data is essentially fake data? And uh, when we have uh, uh, synthetic data that models uh, complex social phenomena, isn't there a real danger that it is simply rubbish and will give rise to bad inferences and insights? Um, yes, so I, I think on, on that first question, you know, how do we protect rights in the context of synthetic data use? I mean, here, if, if we think that projections, industry projections, are that synthetic data will be used to train 60% of AI <laughs> um, models by uh, 2025, then this is about to have a very significant influence on individual rights, <laughs> uh, because the data that is used to, to, to model um, AI systems will ultimately have a, an impact on the output of those systems. Um, and here, the industry claim in a lot of the literature, and obviously there's no single claim, but um, Harvard Business Review has, for instance, published a piece simply saying that synthetic data is not personal data. I think looking at the case law of the European Court of Justice, we could question that claim in its own right. But more fundamentally, um, this goes to the point of whether or not the data protection framework is designed to protect personal data? Or is it designed to protect people from data driven harms? And I would say we have had quite a, a broad interpretation of the data protection framework so far, recognizing that its primary function is to protect individuals in the context of data processing. And so I think you could make a kind of a purpose of argument that we could have data protection without personal data. <laughs> um, but I, you know, obviously this would be heavily contested. In any event, whether or not personal data is used, I think you could clearly see um, privacy implications of the use of synthetic data for um, decision-making about individuals. On the point about the, the veracity or the utility of that data, you know, this is something I think that would need to be kind of tested on a case-by-case -case basis. But again, the claim is sometimes made in the literature that this kind of solves that kind of privacy utility trade-off that we often see, that data can be either private or it can be useful. And synthetic data kind of claims, well, it's, it's both. It's both private and useful. But actually, the more useful the data, the more, um, the more representative it is of reality, <laughs> the more revealing it is about individuals. <laughs> and therefore, um, of course, we'll have issues with kind of fake data that is completely unrepresentative, but there might there will also be issues, I think, with data that is so precise and so correct um, that it removes any ability for the individual 
to obfuscate their identity in the digital environment? You know, we, we could ask that question is, is it possible to have data that is too correct? <laughs> and what are the implications of that? If I withhold my data in some contexts, could that data set be, um, be completed with synthetic data in a way that undermines my rights of kind of self-determination around my information? I think there are loads of interesting questions like that that will need to be resolved. Thanks. We have time for uh, one uh, final question, Orla. Uh, so there's a question on social media and banking data on, on takeaway habits was proposed as a way of tracking to what extent people were observing social distancing rules during the pandemic. Uh, this was a strategy uh, proposed by a private company consulting with the Minister of Health. How can this be justified in relation to data protection law? Um, that's a fantastic example, Rina. Um, so I, I think this very nicely illustrates that breakdown of public and private divides that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, my short answer was, I, I don't think that could be compliant with data protection law because a, a kind of a central plank of data protection is an idea of purpose limitation. The data that you collect for one purpose shouldn't be used for another inconsistent purpose. But I think it also illustrates that once data are there, um, and being processed, that, that there will be a temptation for this kind of function creep with the data uh, and, for, and for private companies to propose kind of useful data in this way to public authorities. And um, obviously we have legal principles that are constraining public authorities in those situations, but we would also need kind of ethical and, and other principles to guide how data is being used in that kind of context. Hey, thanks uh, uh, very much, uh, Ola. I think we have to move on to uh, our next speaker. So thanks, thanks again, Ola, for, for a fascinating uh, presentation. And uh, I, I suspect we will come back to, to some of the issues that, that you've raised in, in your talk uh, this morning. Uh, so let me uh, uh, then introduce our second speaker. Uh, professor Afra Kerr, who is Professor in Sociology at uh, Maynooth University, where she also chairs the MA in the Sociology of Digital Societies. Uh, professor Kerr is currently a funded principal investigator and science lead within the Transparent Digital Governance Strand at the ADAPT Center for Digital Content Technology, and this is a center funded by the Irish sorry, by the Science Foundation Ireland. Her current research uh, focuses on the ethics and social impacts of artificial intelligence across media, games, and everyday smart technologies. She also researches governance of digital technologies and diversity and inclusion in STEM and the cultural industries. Professor Kerr's books include Global Games, Production, Circulation and Policy in the Networked Age, which was published with Rightledge in 2017. And she's the Associated Editor of the International Encyclopedia of Digital Communication and Society, published with Riley Blackwell in 2015. In 2016, uh, Professor Kerr received the Distinguished Scholar Award from the International Digital Games Research Association. And in 2021, she was accepted into the Academy of Europe. The title of her presentation this morning is Risks and Responsibilities in Smart Societies. So a handover to Professor Kerr. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, and thank you to the Royal Irish Academy and to the organisers of this Ireland 2030 um, initiative and for giving us kind of time and space, I suppose, to think about, reflect on our work and where things might be going uh, in the next um, eight years, uh, the medium term, I suppose we should say. I'm just going to share some uh, slides here and then start formally. And maybe if somebody could uh, tell me if these are all looking okay? Yes, they do. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, I guess uh, given that my background is in social sciences, I hope this will be very complementary to what we've heard in the first talk. And thank you to Orla for her very lucid um, presentation to talk about 
the various challenges and issues, particularly in, in terms of the legal and in terms of remedies. Um, what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about some uh, current projects and ongoing and starting projects that I'm involved in, which raise some similar issues, but also maybe uh, uh, broaden it out even a little bit beyond the legal frameworks. So um, today, what I was hoping to do was look at some of these dominant imaginaries in smart societies, um, this kind of data driven innovation, um, then look at some examples from research that we've been doing on the ways in which governance is enacted um, uh, within kind of consumer and everyday uh, initiatives that already exist and the ways or the space uh, that we have, the agency we might have as hu humans to negotiate in these spaces. And then I'm going to move on to the kind of work that we're just developing, looking at, um, should we say, struggles over the kind of imaginaries and ideas that are getting embedded in uh, technologies and uh, many areas of society around artificial intelligence and the kind of roles of ethics and maybe where and how we need to go beyond that. And finally, just finishing up with some ideas. So that's kind of the outline of what I have for the 25 minutes or so today. So um, many of you might know some of this literature, but maybe some of you, you don't. And um, there's a really emerging literature in the last kind of five, six years coming from critical media, social sciences, um, surveillance studies, really looking at the level of the data, but also platforms, and then more broadly at the embedding of digital societies in everyday lives. Now, my PhD um, a few years ago now was in, this, in the area of communications and digital communications. And we very much at that point focused on the media. But now, really, we have to focus on the embedding of these digital technologies across all spheres of life. And we're starting to see a very interesting critical literature in the social sciences around what this means for human agency, for forms of citizenship, and for fundamental rights as we know them. And how and where are the spaces to negotiate these rights and values. Now, as one of the kind of key uh, terms that we see coming out a lot as scholars are starting to look at these aspects uh, in everyday life is this theory of datification and how it's not just that the data is being gathered in many spaces about us, sometimes with our consent, sometimes not. Uh, so this is not just a technical process, but there are very much embedded cultural politics within this, as well as fairly uh, extensive economic and business models. And that many of these are starting to shift power and relations in ways that we are only starting to understand. And I'd point, scholar, uh, point you to some of this work by scholars in, in Cardiff, in the kind of data justice research programs there by Arnie Hintz and Lena Denchik uh, and Karen Wall Jorgensen, who have already written about this in relation extensively to policing in the UK and starting to really unpack what are these processes. People will probably know, I know that this was mentioned right up at the start by Philip, the emergence of new business paradigms around surveillance capitalism or others would say data capitalism or platform capitalism. And this really we're starting to see embedded in many, many different what companies are doing is this idea that both gathering data about consumers and citizens and then innovating with that data and extracting value is at the core of contemporary business models and that there's very little questioning of that and in fact there's promotion of that both by uh, companies and by many states. But this is not particularly new in terms of the kind of focus on the market and the data and the extraction of value. If we look at work by Robin Mansell from the LSE, I mean, she talks about the sorts of social imaginaries that we saw embedded in the information society, if you like the precursor ideas to the current data capitalism. And for her, there really was one dominant uh, imaginary driving the focus on the information society. And in many cases, we see very lot of similarities with surveillance capitalism. There's an idea that it's economic centered. There's a focus on the individual driven by larger discourses of neoliberalism, individual freedom of choice, and about information processing and transmission. 
And what we're losing or what we're often is lacking in the kind of dominant imaginary, and we do have counter discourses, is this focus on maybe public values, common goods, uh, civic politics. And this would be, I think, danger if as Ireland goes towards 2030, that we only focus and narrow towards one imaginary and we allow that, that to dominate everything, particularly as we look at our public spaces and public sphere. So what is digital citizenship at this point and how can we start to think about it? Well, I think it's very much dominated in much of the discourse by a similar social imaginary to the information society. That is something that focuses on the market, that focuses on users uh, as service users, as consumers, and that governance has been focused on as governance from above. Multi-stakeholder, but actually dominated by a very narrow set of stakeholders, often corporate and state. And this is something that we need to be aware of and think about if we are going to imagine different futures in the next years. Right. We do see some alternative discourses. We see some focus on people centric technologies. We see a push to broaden into ethics and think about ethics. And we see uh, risk based approaches to governance. The questions, of course, are, are these at all effective in uh, reducing, mitigating what is the dominant imaginary? And I suppose, how can we then start to govern these omnipresent systems, which are largely borderless when many of our regulatory systems and other remedies are state based? And this, as we think of transnational, if we think of something like Meta, which is uh, you know, transnational used by many, many different countries. Then we start to look beyond this and start to think about the environmental and climatic impacts of some of these data surveillance systems. We really need to go beyond this dominant narrow market imaginary. And that's kind of finally, I did want to think about, you know, when we have a shared Ireland, if we look at an all Ireland perspective, when we look at it from a European perspective, and then from global perspectives, what are the effective interventions in this space? So moving on to just some examples of work that we've done to look at the kind of complexity of governance in the age of the digital. Because to understand where we can intervene, we need to, I suppose, map this complexity. We are talking about formal and informal practices in many of these different institutions. We are also talking about these kind of dispersed and flexible forms of organization, which really makes it hard to track the areas, the forms of power that are at work and to try to mitigate some of these, particularly for those who don't have a voice in these different discourses. They often are the subject or so we say the object of many of the surveillance activities, but they may not have a voice or may not have read remedies available to them or they may not know about the remedies. Now, this may seem like a little bit of a leap, but actually when I started to study digital citizenship and governance, I was studying it within the digital game space. Now, I'm not expecting anybody necessarily here to be experts in digital games, but when we were looking at massive multiplayer online games in the, in the kind of last um, decade, something like World of Warcraft, which at the time maybe had 10 million subscribers, EVE Online, you know, was talking about, you know, a quarter of a million subscribers. We were looking at complex online spaces that companies were trying to mediate and govern. And so, you know, we could see these as a kind of precursor to some of the later kind of smart everyday technologies. And what did we start to see in these complex online spaces? Well, we started to see governance through code, which Lawrence Lessig, of course, famously said code is law, that we could see that the governance of this space was being enacted through software and through technology, in some cases through the game rules. We also saw contract laws, we saw uh, end user license agreements being put in place, which of course consumers had to sign up to before they could use these spaces. We saw an awful lot of peer regulation, participatory surveillance, if you like, of players watching other players to make sure they were playing by the rules. We saw then companies increasingly as their games grew, having to put in 
official um, hire people to be community managers of these spaces and to put in reporting mechanisms where players could report other players activities and then we had a whole plethora of non-legal types of websites explaining how to behave in these spaces now these kind of five different layers was when i started to think about the both the visible the invisible the formal the informal forms of governance in these spaces and these of course were commercial spaces that we were focusing on in, in, in this point but I was struck by the fact that even in these commercial spaces, they started to introduce algorithms to punish players who are cheating and ban them. And we also saw within the end user license agreements that uh, players were signing up and giving in a consent to monitor clause, the fact that their computers could be monitored at any time by pieces of software. And nearly all of the games we looked at at this space, users were signing up and giving out these consents to monitor. And what in reality this meant is that game companies were running software on game players' computers to scan the hard drives and to check for cheating software. So we found that this seemed to be incredible overreach for the types of behaviours which they were trying to govern. And we've published on some of these in some open access um, journals that you see here, perhaps Surveillance and Society did a special issue on governance of digital spaces focused on games and play. Now, while at this point games and play might have seemed, um, you know, a leisure activity that weren't, wasn't um, uh, particularly, you know, a core part of society, what we did see was we had unseen forms of workers and new forms of jobs being created in the background, which were increasingly seen more recently in terms of content moderation work. And this work has been written about um, by Sarah Roberts behind the screen and people like Mary Gray, ghost workers. So we're seeing new jobs being created in some of the commercial industries and their role is to moderate and mediate uh, the relationships between the companies and their consumers, but in ways which again are largely invisible. And when we went to do this work and to interview community managers about their work and the governance of these spaces, they were to, we were told by many we, they couldn't talk to us about their work because their contracts forbid them to talk to researchers or journalists or others about the conditions of their work and the roles that they had. Moving on more recently then to work on the smart city, we've taken what we knew from digital governance, digital citizenship, and started to look at um, smart cities and smart technologies. This is work by a PhD student, a graduated PhD student from MUR Maynooth, which was looking at the standardization of smart cities and the use of standards to impose um, uh, uh, shared understandings of smart cities. And what is a smart city apart from a relatively successful advertising slogan? Well, it is, of course, about applying technologies to solve um, uh, governance issues, a technological solution, if you like, to large scale organizational, administrative and, and people governance. Uh, it is about reducing in some cases or privatizing in other cases the governance of our city spaces. And we do have this, we have examples of this in Smart Dublin, where we have a whole range of initiatives which are about exploring what uses can technology be put to in cities to govern our spaces. And when we look at who's innovating in this space, we see it's a constellation of very large companies, it is about university sectors, and it is about state actors. And full disclosure, uh, we have through ADAPT uh, and other um, initiatives, we have been starting to engage with Smart Dublin to look at, well, how, what kinds of forms of digital citizenship will emerge from these types of projects.
We are also seeing alternative projects not being run by the cities themselves or companies, but research projects. This is a project that's been run from the Technological University of Dublin and with partners in France and in Ecuador and other countries, which is starting to look at alternative imaginaries or alternative ways of imagining a smart city. What can we do where the citizens can contribute in ways which are explicit and are less damaging to the climate, how can we imagine real smart cities which are contributory, which are digital, but are, which are also perhaps empowering in a way which goes beyond some of the very limited market imaginaries that we're seeing in some of the smart city initiatives. We had run as part of this project initiatives where we started to look at um, what did being included in a smart city actually mean in reality? We did research in Dublin, we did research in Ecuador. Of course, what we found is people were using many of the same social media platforms as part of their everyday lives, Facebook, YouTube, all of these different dominant social uh, media um, initiatives. But in many cases, they did not know how the data capitalism was working, and they really didn't have much knowledge of any remedies or how they could be empowered to enact in these spaces. And so we've written about how to find common ground between the citizens and the cities uh, in the smart city initiatives. So just because people are included and in many cases, we don't have a lot of choice about being included in a smart city initiative because the minute we walk down the, the road, the minute we tap into the buses, we are generating uh, data for many of these citizen initiatives. The question is, what does that actually mean for us as citizens? Is this actually marginalizing some people and some areas of the city which are not getting services and prioritizing other areas of the city which are getting services? And so, you know, at the core of our argument here is that in data capitalism, it's all about optimization. But to do that, certain people and areas will get marginalized. And it is important for us as social scientists and then as other critical scholars to think about, well, what are our cities going to be by 2030? If we are creating digital footprints and data footprints, what kind of data shadows are being created? We know that there are a lot of issues with the data that's being created. And it's really interesting to hear Orla talking about the synthetic data, because of course, what we hear all the time and in the conference we had yesterday was that the, you know there's not enough data, we can't get access to data, we'll just create synthetic data. Well, what does that mean for the citizen if we have imperfect or too perfect data shadows which are following us around and perhaps being shared between the social welfare and other city departments um, which then start to influence our ability to get maybe social welfare payments, maybe get access to uh, mortgages or other elements of everyday life. Now, the work that we're doing in ADAPT and we've started to do uh, is really, it's a kind of a six year program. But the first part of what we've been doing, at least in our small aspect of this, is really to ask who are the key actors who are shaping contemporary expectations of AI. Now, the companies, the game companies I looked at 10 years ago were already using AI technologies. What's interesting for me is how this now has spread to many other areas of society and this language around data-driven innovation has become, if you like, the next paradigm of how companies are meant to innovate. And we're seeing a real struggle about trying to shape if you like, the terms of engagement around smart societies, and we have formal and informal mechanisms trying to shape that future imaginary. So now expectations is, is uh, the social expectations is a subfield, if you like, within science and technology studies. And we have seen many papers being published on the sociology of expectations and how companies and states try to shape expectations around technologies. 
And why do they do this? Well, they do this to justify resources and investment and to try and steer actors and companies and organizations in a similar, if you like, innovation pathway. And what we see is they run research priority exercises, they do road mapping exercises, they fund innovation programs on certain priorities. Currently, AI is a significant priority, investment priority within Ireland, within Europe, within the UK, within the US. We see training programs then launched on the back of these. So this language is really important that we investigate and, and ask questions about what is a smart so uh, society and what might it be? What are the other ways in which we can imagine these frameworks um, to go beyond perhaps some of the ways in which the current policies are being imagined? Uh, are being imagined. And what I like, I, I like that in the early part of our discussion so far, we've talked about the performativity of some of these kinds of exercises, because sometimes we see a lot of language and discourse being used at a certain level of performativity. The question is, how effective are these? So, uh, you know, at this distinction between generic performativity and effective performativity, again, has been written about before by some people like Donald McKenzie from the University of Edinburgh, who's written about stock markets and financial markets and how the models actually can end up shaping uh, and driving the trading and the actions of markets, which Philip mentioned right at the top. Effective performativity of models and language makes a real difference in practice. And in our uh, paper on expectations around AI, we looked at consultant reports, we looked at Irish and UK government reports, we looked at public surveys. And in an article that we published, you can see a list of these 41 documents that we analysed around the social shaping of expectations. And we could see there was a real breakdown in the period from 2012 right up to um, uh, 2020. We could see a real focus on AI, but many of the government reports were incredibly positive about the um, possibilities of applying AI across society. And then we had some very small cases, but highly significant cases, of negative expectations or negative discourses of AI, where workers who work within companies, whistleblowers, and if you like contrarians, raised significant issues about AI. These are some examples of the positive uh, expectations, all of these data-driven innovation reports. We have national reports where ICT and AI is part of our priority funding areas. We have ethics initiatives starting to be launched around 2016. We have at the same time, and I'm sorry, I'm just going through these to flash up some examples, we have significant controversies. People starting to realize on the back of very brave whistleblowers and other activists that maybe actually we need to put some brakes on here or we need to know what's going on in practice behind the scenes when companies and states are applying these types of technologies. We also ran a smallish public survey in the Science Gallery in Ireland to ask people about their ethical expectations of AI. And people did have a sense that AI was different from previous technologies. They also had a sense that uh, AI is shaped to some degree by the engineers and designers of the technologies, and so that this was something we need to think about carefully. And when we asked them what did they think were key ethical issues, we could see that safety and privacy and transparency and security really came to the fore. But other people were starting to think about other issues like discrimination and dignity, even if they hadn't fully framed or hadn't got the language necessarily to think about these issues as yet. And who should be responsible for governing these technologies? Well, it was clear that people thought, at least in the Irish context, and this might differ in another, that it needed to be a constellation of actors. In Ireland, we tended to I'm not sure why I necessarily uh, um, put our trust in governments or state regulatory bodies. And this to me would suggest we really need to put our focus on what these bodies are doing and how can they govern these types of spaces. 
So at the end of our, that paper, our first kind of initiative focusing on AI and expectations and social shaping of AI, what we found was that, um, you know, at the point we published this, the AI Act was just being talked about, but we did have a lot of discussion on AI ethics. The high level expert group had already published their uh, reports. But to us, it seemed that ethics was being used as like an insurance policy and as assurance, as really about starting to get technologists to think about ethical issues. But it was unclear to us how this was going to be actually effective. It seemed to be more performative on a generic level rather than effective. And now if I just, um, and if people are interested in this research, it was open access available in um, uh, big data and society. So just to close, I just had my timer there in 25 minutes. What are we seeing at the moment around digital citizenship and government? We're seeing a lot of focus on technological solutions and people starting to think maybe ethics is not enough. This is a big conference, multidisciplinary conference, which is held every year at the moment. We're starting to see lots and lots of initiatives around AI and frameworks. This is from the Council of Europe's roadmap, which are starting to bring forward more of a focus on human rights, and on privacy and on fundamental rights. So rights is coming more into the debate, I would say, in shaping how we're thinking about digital citizenship. We're seeing, of course, the beginnings of the AI regulation, and I'm sure some of my other legal colleagues will focus more on this. But at the same time, there's a lot of work to be done, right? There really is a role for a broader debate, particularly in the social scientists, and for social scientists to work with our technology colleagues to start to think about uh, democracy and governance in the area of artificial intelligence. This is too important to leave to either technocratic uh, uh, um, uh, governors or to uh, the technology makers. I think there's, we need to go beyond ethics. We need to think about uh, the societal expectations in Europe are that responsibility will be shared between private and public actors. It's unclear that this will be an effective governance strategy. I think we need to also look to the activists. We need to look to a broader framing of this. We need to look to the design and governance of AI, not leave it till the very end when these things have already been developed. And we need to think about the effective remedies, accountability that Orla has outlined. So finally, to conclude, I think there's a dominant imaginary, but it didn't start with AI. It's something that really started with the information society debates, but now it has shifted to data capitalism. It's about extracting value from the data shadows. It's about a performance of ethics and citizen engagement, but we're not really there yet in terms of effective performativity. We really haven't started the debate on the environmental impact of these data-driven innovations. And this is crucial if you look at the IPP, IPCC reports that are coming out at the moment. We know very little about some of the rights of the workers who are having to work in mediating the technologies because of the fact that artificial intelligence is actually not terribly intelligent uh, and not terribly artificial when you look at how the current systems work in practice. And I think we need different imaginaries. And it's great to have this debate and have space to think about rights, public values, activism and regulation and working together with some of our technical scholars who are really invested in this space. So I'll leave it there and thank you for giving me the time to share these thoughts. Thank you very much, Afra, for a very rich analysis of, of the different dimensions of, of digital citizenship. And I think also for, for drawing up this distinction between the dominant imaginaries and you know, you know, probing, probing the alternative ways of thinking about uh, digital citizenship. I think that's a really, really important uh, aspect. And, and, and the other thing, of course, that came out, the other dimension that, that came out of your talk very strongly was this, this impetus. And again, this challenge to engage in interdisciplinary 
uh, investigations uh, beyond the humanities and social sciences family and, and extending into um, technology and, and, and design and, and also of course working with, with, with companies who, who develop technology. Uh, so I think we have uh, uh, one question at the moment and again I would encourage uh, the audience to uh, post their questions in the chat function. Um, on, on the issue of, of privacy and rights, uh, we have a question whether technolo technological developments force us to rethink what it means to be a private person, of course, a question that goes right to the heart of citizenship, and that cultural historians would argue that privacy is a modern invention due to developments like the multiplication of individual rooms in, in dwelling houses. Dwelling houses. So how, 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 how can we think about digital citizenship in, in sort of this broader uh, uh, historical context? Well, I, I teach social shaping of technologies in men youth and, you know, um, our students are always um, really intrigued when I talk about the invention of the telephone and how people really objected to the invasion of the private domestic space by this ringing technology. And they also were not sure what it would be used for. And the companies had to had to publish books of etiquette of how to answer a telephone and what to do with a telephone and people really resisted it and i do think that this idea of invasion of private space is actually i would think a much longer term uh, idea it's not a more recent thing uh, in terms of privacy it may be um, that in different cultural contexts we might have a different way of thinking about privacy but certainly in the anglophone worlds in which i've mostly studied uh, technologies i do think it's very interesting to see how people have often resisted historically for our about 150 years, those technologies which really disrupt things they have felt are important to their lives, their domestic spaces, for example, uh, their uh, ability and rights to go to shared public spaces, to demonstrate, to be uh, able to demonstrate in public spaces. And what we're starting to see as we've moved from, uh, you know, the current crop of digital technologies is some of the ideas of what constitutes our digital private space at home, our domestic space, but also our public spaces, our squares, our, our city streets are being reimagined uh, where the breaking of down of boundaries between public and private are really breaking down, but without citizens being really engaged in that debate. I don't know if I want uh, cameras all the way down the streets, I don't want a biometric, uh, you know, scanning of my face when I am uh, going to, to, you know, Smithfield Square or Stevens Green. I don't want, and this is really interesting as we start to do online teaching and education. I notice when I'm not in view of my webcam in the university campus, when I'm recording my lecture, it's actually will stop working. Why? Because it's continuously scanning, I suspect, for my face. Now, this was not part of the discussion around the COVID switch to online teaching and engagement, was that we might be using these AI technologies without a debate with staff about the recording of our faces, our spaces and our lectures, the sharing of these online, and then whose rights do, who owns these lecture slides uh, in this. So there's a real a kind of pushing over because of emergency situations, right? Whether it's COVID, whether it's climate, whether it's now war, these are all part of what Orla was talking about, the legitimate interests or it's an exceptional circumstances. But, you know, we've had too many exceptional circumstances now, I would suggest. Um, and we really need this time and space to start thinking about what actually are we letting go and who's driving this debate, right? It is not and should not be driven just by corporate interests without the engagement of other people. Sorry, that was a bit of a long answer. But. Well, it's an excellent answer. And, and I think it, it also illustrates very, very clearly uh, sort of this, this intersection of time and space and, and how it is shaped by, by digital technologies. We have time for one, uh, uh, one further question. Um, last week, a, a speaker at, at uh, the panel session spoke about AI and languages used by 
<clears throat> Google Translate and initiatives by Ma Ma Maori speakers to claim data sovereignty. Is there a discourse emerging around cultural and group rights in relation to AI? Or is the emphasis on individual rights and the individual right to privacy, for example? Um, so there's probably others who are much better uh, equipped to, to speak on this. Um, and I know people like Tracy Laureate in Canada and other scholars have looked at data sovereignty and, and the ways in which we narrow data to an individual and the personal rights, but that in other cultures and communities, data is shared is 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 part of the shared cultural imaginary is part of their history it's part of their oral history it should never be captured in the ways in which we think we should capture and extract value that would be completely anathema to the cultures perhaps uh the indigenous cultures at least in canada and the work i know that tracy has been doing i wonder if it's something similar with the maori cultures and the ways in which you know certain figureheads are the the holders of the imaginary and the history and the culture of those of those groups and then the idea that this would be abstracted often without their knowledge or their agreement uh it would seem would be you know completely anathema to them and i think it's it's really important for us to look at that there are areas where ai is really important with low resource languages like for example the irish language where we can actually get more work translated into the language if we use some AI because there's not enough fluent speakers who can translate. But on the other side, so it's not all bad, I don't want to be completely negative here, um, but on the other side, I think we have to be really respectful of the ownership rights and the shared cultural rights of uh, Indigenous communities. Okay, well, let me thank you again, Nafa, for uh, an excellent presentation and, and also for your insightful uh, comments. And uh, we, we move on without further ado to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dahi McShihi, who is Head of Research at the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dunleary. Prior to joining the Institute, he was Professor of Law and Innovation at Queen's University Belfast, where he worked on projects including Future Screens NI, the Northern Bridge Doctoral Training Partnership, and a new Master's Degree in Law and Technology. Dr. McShee is author of Medium Law, which was published with Rightledge in 2019, and he has published widely on law, media, and technology. In 2019, he was awarded an Eisenhower Fellowship. The title of uh, Dr. McShee's presentation this morning is Media Regulation 2030, Everything Old is New Again, and that's a question mark at the end. So I'll hand over to you, Diane. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all involved in the organisation of this morning's session. It's been a real pleasure listening to Orla and Afra's work, and I hope I can add something small to it over the course of the next few minutes. On this day in 1854, Otmar Morgenthaler, or Morgenthaler, was born. Morgenthaler was a German immigrant to the United States. He moved from Germany to Baltimore at the age of 18, and he has a really interesting, sometimes overlooked role in media history. Morgenthaler invented the linotype machine in and around 1884 or 1885, which allowed for the first time for the mechanical printing of text by line rather than by character. Some sources of the time highlighted his role as being a second Gutenberg, Although actually the first book printed through this new machine was not a Bible, but perhaps reflecting the spirit of the day, a book on sports, the Tribune book of open air sports, which was supported by the New York Tribune. We'll come back to that a little later. But more broadly, the new linotype machine had a transformative impact on the business of news. For one thing, it allowed newspapers to extend beyond eight pages. It made publishing a much faster process, albeit for many years following 1885, still one that involved a wide range of specialist skills and expensive and heavy equipment. In his opening remarks today, Professor Roseman spoke about breathlessness 
and acceleration, which is something that Otmar Morgenthaler really would have recognized in the late 19th century, and indeed a theme to which I'll return at the end of my remarks today. I'm going to emphasize in the context of our exploration of Ireland 2030, uh, two things with a wee bit of an emphasis on unfashionable ideas, arguably. Uh, I'm going to, so I'm going to talk about media regulation and I'm going to talk about um, urban planning. And on a morning where I'm waking up to news reports about whether former President Trump should be back on Twitter, we're also going to meet three unsuccessful candidates for US president along the way. So I'm going to speak first about how the ideas and the challenges of media regulation remain important and are central to our panel discussions today, as my colleagues have already uh, identified in a number of ways, even though it may well be the case that the conventionally organized print and broadcast media continue to come under pressure from disintermediation, cord cutting and changes in demand and attention. So in this first section of my talk, I'll identify three areas of media regulation that have something particular to say to our current and future conditions. That is the coverage of major events, the status of public service media and the reform of defamation law. So turning to that first topic of major events. Now, as somebody who did, again, a number of years ago, doctoral research on broadcasting law, I've often found that the one bit of European broadcasting regulation um, that people from outside the field have heard about and have something to say about is the requirement now found for the record in Article 14 of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive that um, where states designate events as being of major importance, um, their transmission can then be restricted to uh, free to air services. Uh, with various conditions as to live events, delayed events, and so on. Um, this is a, a very European compromise in some ways because the legal infrastructure for this is it's almost entirely European. It's a creature of, um, of European law through a directive in the case of most states. Um, but the lists are entirely national, but subject to the European Commission's approval. Only about half of the member states of the European Union have taken up the option to do this, and uh, some have not changed the lists uh, in, in, in quite some time. The, the legislation here dates from the 1997 reform of European, um, of European broadcasting law. I think it tells a story about nations, though. Um, Ireland's list, like a number of member states, is entirely sporting. Um, but the, the sports listed vary a lot from state to state. So while um, while many member states list um, the, uh, the 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 FIFA World Cup final, uh, the Olympic Games, and so on, um, there is also significant regional variation. Uh, major finals in alpine skiing are listed in Austria. Nordic skiing listed in Finland. Handballs on the list in Denmark, and water polo is on the list in Hungary. Various specifically identified bicycle road races are spelled out in great detail in the Belgian list and, of course, um, uh, certain uh, uh, fixtures within the hurling and football calendars uh, in Ireland uh, appear on, on, on that list. In terms of the law, it doesn't have to be sport, although, as I said, it often is. So um, the, the Vienna Philharmonic's New Year's Day concert is uh, an event of major importance under Austrian law. Uh, as is the, uh, the Vienna Opera Ball, and the opening light, uh, night of La Scala uh, in Italy is on the Italian list. Characteristically, the UK had done this slightly differently, um, adopting domestic legislation before the 1997 directive, um, expressing it as sporting or other event of, uh, of national interest, and remains in force um, uh, post-Brexit, although a very recent white paper on broadcasting in the UK uh, calls into question uh, whether the UK should continue with this with this system of designating events of major importance. Uh, nonetheless, the UK has already added to it, again reflecting cultural and sporting changes, um, uh, for instance now li listing the Women's Football World Cup final alongside um, uh, what had already been present in respect of men's football. More fundamentally, I think that this being a part of broadcasting law and identified as a European matter recognises the special relationship that exists between media, business um, and society, including uh, organisation in sports and music and elsewhere. The Canadian economic and communications historian Harold Innes, who I wrote about in 
my book Medium Law, as, as mentioned in the introduction, um, actually talked in the context of, um, of Morgan Teller's linotype about um, about advertising and freedom of the press, and how they relate to one another. Innes argued that, um, that aspects of speech and communication were being atomized by the pulverizing effects of the application of machine industry to communication. Um, and I think Innes's critique um, and the, the European protection of major events is echoed when we, when we run into difficulties or when we, when we, we wonder about paywalls in the in the news business when we ask about the proliferation of subscription services um, the spread across netflix disney plus amazon prime and whatever you're having itself um, the way the future of the cinema as we return to physical in-person exhibition and the idea is that when we're when we do talk about coverage of sporting events when we do talk about paywalls when we do talk about the role of cinemas and netflix we're actually debating of course access to culture and participation in shared moments of national importance i take this then into a second and broader aspect of media regulation that I'd like to highlight today, um, which is the ongoing discussion of the role of public service broadcasting or more properly public service media um, in democratic states. Uh, many in Ireland, of course, are familiar with two of the major public service models, the BBC's model, um, uh, where funding is, is almost entirely from, uh, from the licence fee, and the, the model in Ireland where RT is funded by a combination of the licence fee and advertising. But of course, public service uh, media and addressing concepts of plurality and range uh, are found are found beyond BBC and RTE. Both Ireland and the UK have established community radio sectors um, uh, with, with appropriate legal uh, protection. And uh, both jurisdictions have also seen different experiments with concepts of public service. So in the UK, the, uh, the role of ITV, particularly in its regional days, um, had a, a, an alternative model that balanced access to infrastructure and prominence with certain regional obligations. Uh, speaking as someone who grew up, grew up in the HTV bit of Ireland rather than the UTV bit of Ireland, an interesting introduction to, uh, to the geography of, of these islands. Um, and of course, in Ireland, we see uh, for a number of years now, the use of the license fee to support a range of radio and television broadcasters beyond RTE through the Sound and Vision Scheme, uh, coordinated by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Of course, only true devotees of media regulation may be aware of other organisational models for public service media, including, for instance, subscription-driven model um, for public broadcasting in the United States, NPR, uh, PBS, etc., or the model in a number of European states, especially, for instance, in the Netherlands, of having a range of associations who have access to transmission time, um, historically uh, organised along religious, political, etc. lines, although not as much so the case in the 21st century. And in the week of Eurovision, of all things, we think of the role of European public service broadcasters and indeed Australian public service broadcasters, uniquely part of Europe on for, for one Saturday night only. Um, uh, again, having moments of cultural exchange and importance, uh, as with the discussion earlier on on, um, on sporting events, uh, where we see uh, a, a, a role of um, of shared exchange or of um, uh, uh, almost a, a virtual water cooler juxtaposed with a technological and media environment uh, which which has significantly changed in respect of um, of, of, of user generated material of the reliance upon platforms and so forth. And so the types of things that we have debated in the last couple of years um, do echo the 19th century news business, but in curious ways, uh, the role of, um, of, of truth and fact and fact checking, the way in which the UK has wondered about the future of Channel 4. Channel 4 is a really unique broadcaster as a public service, but entirely ad funded. Um, the question as to whether the intervention of the state here is about um, filling in gaps in markets in respect of minority languages, um, current affairs, cultural coverage, or so on, um, or is it about having a public service rationale in areas that are served by a market, popular music, and so on? Um, what public service media says in respect of um, of online, uh, which both BBC and RT have, have have grappled with from a technological perspective, but also for 
instance in respect of competition law. Um, and over the last couple of years, the role that um, uh, that broadcasters and media organisations, particularly, although not exclusively, in the public service remit, have played in respect of, for instance, uh, provision of educational materials for um, for remote learning. So again, although I said some of these might seem fairly dusty areas of media regulation um, and of the 20th century media um, environment, um, they they certainly intersect with the types of questions that we're uh, we're discussing this morning and indeed across this series. The last point I'd make on media regulation specifically uh, is about is about defamation. And again, we go back to the the newspapers and the uh, the evolution of the printing press, uh, but also a uh, a relationship between between technology and and regulation. Um, I'll make two points about um, about defamation. Uh, the first is the what I might call the unfinished business of reform. And Ireland is a really interesting case here. Uh, we have a constitutional context um, which is very recognisable um, at the European level, where there is reference both to freedom of expression and to the right of uh, right to a good name. Um, but also, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the the common law, legal traditions, and body of case law um, that uh, straddles um, Ireland, uh, the United Kingdom, and and various other um, states. And so, in some some respects, the big reform of defamation law in Ireland, which now dates back unbelievably to two thousand and nine, kind of jumped ahead of what was happening in in aspects of the common law world, um, drawing upon developments in Australia and Canada, but certainly going further than had been the case, for instance, in England and Wales. But two thousand and nine is a long time ago now, and the case law that's developed in England and Wales under its two thousand and thirteen reforms um, has had a, a limited impact on on Ireland because of the the differences in uh, in statute. Um, the Royal Irish. Academy itself uh, convened a very um, consequential discussion of uh, of defamation um, in 2019, and just a couple of months ago, the Department of Justice has published um, its uh, its paper on on defamation re reform. Uh, but certainly, you know, in that intervening period between 2009, the um, the technological and media landscapes themselves have changed. Um, the discussion of fact and accuracy and reputation has uh, has transformed in, in 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 all sorts of ways and it is a major task um, for Ireland to now to now undertake my second point in defamation of course maybe contradicting my first is that we we we, we focus on defamation law reform um, uh, at our at our peril because the emergence over the last couple of decades of parallel claims has meant that if we can confine a response to defamation for instance the way in which liability shields for um, for platforms have been developed in england and wales um means that we we miss out on, on what's happened in privacy law and misuse of private information or indeed data protection itself uh, it's a much more complicated picture now um, some will argue that the the oligarchs and the celebrities um who may have some options cut off by libel reform uh, by defamation reform, uh, simply move seamlessly into talking about private information and data protection. Um, others will argue that this is alarmist and that there are safeguards built into uh, to, to those areas and that the fundamental rights context of today, um, including at a European level and recognisable um, in the Irish constitution, is one that does not uh, identify freedom of expression as the only relevant right, but in instead requires the balance to be struck. I think um, all of these issues still uh, would be, you know, you know, rec recognise the 19th, 20th, 19th and 20th century press context quite nicely. And um, coming back to to Harold Innes, who I've already uh, cited, um, Innes critiqued the the kind of combination of technology and constitutional law that would lead to what he called monopolies of knowledge and argued that those on the receiving end of material, material from a mechanized central system are precluded from participation in healthy, vigorous and vital discussion. Um, and I think today we would see that as that kind of one of the, the, the great kind of unresolved questions of media regulation around rights of reply. Um, and, and whether speech and counter speech can, can, can go together. The US Supreme Court in its 20th century case law took different approaches to statutory rights of reply, depending on whether it was print or audiovisual. European broadcasting law, at least in theory, uh, asks states to have concepts of reply in broadcasting regulation, also it's very underdeveloped. And some very recent defamation reform projects, including um, in the Canadian province of Ontario, have explored this um, a, a, a little more. But when we talk about um, reputation and and good name and privacy and speech with that idea that, uh, that the technological ability to speak now um, is also going to be affected by access to platforms and by prominence and visibility and circulation um, 
uh, is something that media regulation has a lot to say about, but yet has not entirely um, uh, resolved. So drawing drawing a line under my, uh, my, my sort of media and broadcasting dimension, um, I want to come back via uh, Morgan Teller uh, and, and and get into a discussion for, for my last couple of minutes um, around, uh, around cities and around infrastructure, balancing uh, and adding something interesting to, to today's panel. Um, Morgan Teller's invention of the linotype was revealed to the world in New York City, as you'd expect. Um, in fact, it was at the New York Tribune, one of the great campaigning newspapers of the 19th century, founded by Horace Greeley, um, first of our unsuccessful presidential candidates, utopian campaigner of his day, and for some years, the employer of Karl Marx. We may come back to that as well. Um, but it was actually in the smaller city of Baltimore um, where Morgan Teller uh, carried out the invention and indeed where the, where the linotype was being, um, was being manufactured. Baltimore of its day was a city characterized by immigration, industry and rapid expansion. But in the 20th century, its population declined. Um, Donald Trump infamously called it a disgusting rat and rodent infected mess, infested mess. Um, and perceptions of Baltimore um, are affected by, of course, reports on crime, pro poverty, policing, including race and discrimination. Um, uh, the television series The Wire, again, bringing together newspapers and, uh, and, and cities quite nicely. Um, citizens of the city responded to Trump by putting a giant inflatable rat on the city when he came to give a speech. Um, and of course, this is a city closer to, as closer to Washington DC than Dundalk is to, to Dublin, but that kind of tale of two cities is a, is a, is a really interesting one from, from an American political perspective. From my perspective, um, Baltimore tells a really interesting story about cities and data. Um, uh, the, uh, the mayor of a number of, um, of cycles ago, Martin O'Malley, unsuccessful presidential candidate number two, um, champions statistics and data as an aid to governance, first as, as mayor of Baltimore and then as, um, as governor of the state of Maryland. Um, he took some models developed in New York in respect of policing, um, applied them in policing in Baltimore, but then expanded them out um, in his city, st city stat project um, to kind of have this kind of city dashboard that would improve service delivery. And indeed, at the same time as Trump was making his comments about Baltimore, the US Smart Cities Council made a readiness award to Baltimore, recognizing its approach to community partnerships, inclusive goals, including the digital divide, and an action-oriented approach, which meant that its smart city projects were addressing things like flooding, opioids, and the digital divide. Um, AFRA's excellent discussion of smart cities uh, earlier on recognized the really interesting discursive um, dimensions uh, and the work that's happened at, 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 at Minute by AFRA by, uh, and by, by colleagues is world leading in terms of its, um, it, it, its engagement with imaginaries and, um, and, and discussions of powers and power and control. In my own work, I recall uh, the, the last public talk I gave before COVID, which was at the Institute of International and European Affairs, um, specifically about smart cities and tracing the move away from spreadsheets in the sky with an API to a greater understanding of, um, of social dimensions and an interest in things like mobility rather than, um, uh, rather than monitoring alone, but also huge questions around um, rating and reputation systems, facial recognition, and so on. In his work on social media and scandal, the US scholar J. Richard Stevens talks about the linotype itself as being one of a trio of relevant technological transformations in the late 19th century. The other two were the typewriter and the snap camera. And Stevens argues that the, the, the three together changed the speed with which someone could observe, report, and record and report upon a person's actions. And if we think about smart city projects now, particularly after the last couple of years, um, and the work that Orla spoke about earlier on in terms of datification, uh, intermediation, and power, we see a population that is becoming familiar with scanning QR codes, the downloading of apps, um, the use of Bluetooth, and so on, but also very interesting reassessments of what we do with public space the 15 or 20 minute neighborhood and how that is understood and how um, in a world of um, hybrid and remote working, we think about the, the physical environment. Um, Minute's Rob Kitchen poses the brilliant question in his work, which I, I, I used in that said IIEA talk and still return to even more so in a, in, a, in a panel like this, what would the smart city look like if it was reconfigured by the retrofitting 
repurposing and reinvigoration of civic infrastructure. Because as we know, um, around two thirds of the world's population is expected to live in a city by 2050, but we still have big questions around planning and the regulation of urban life. Ireland's own Project 2040, incorporating the National Development Plan, uh, seeks to address a number of these questions. But if we you know, look at the headlines of the last couple of months around remote working, around housing, around public transport, and around climate, um, those questions of, of ownership and, and, and governance and control that AFRA and, uh, and Orla have highlighted so well are central to areas way beyond the field of, um, of media regulation or information technology law or the types of areas in which I have, I have long dabbled. Um, Professor Roseman opened today by talking about infrastructure um, and had the idea of how the letter was sent. And I think in our panel today, we're, we're, we are exploring that, um, although we're thinking, of course, of digital infrastructure, physical infrastructure and legal infrastructure to bring all of of this together, echoing Rob Kitchen's question. I do think that an overarching approach to technology and the uh, and, and, and the state is something that has great potential. The historian Joe Goldie calls, talks about the infrastructure state, um, where, where actually our model of state power um, is read in light of technological industrial innovation. The economist Mariana Mazzucato talks about the, the role of the state as in, in support for innovation and entrepreneurship. And we can see smart city projects trying to explore that depending on who they're working with and, um, and, and how they approach, um, for instance, ownership of data sets. John Durham Peters, the communications theorist, um, argues for infrastructuralism, noting quite wryly that there were no train crashes before the railroad, but that the, the basic and the boring behind the scenes um, is as interesting and perhaps even, even more interesting than, uh, than some of the issues. So if one wants to understand um, speech in social media, then uh, qu questions of infrastructure are, are hugely important. But this can easily be a catch-all term or a punchline. Um, Unsuccessful presidential candidate number three, number three uh, Pete Buttigieg, who's now Secretary of State for Transportation in the US, um, says that you know it, that the previous administration had used Infrastructure Week as a as a punchline for non-announcements, and indeed the way in which the US legislature has sought to bring together transport, climate, internet access, cyber resilience, and so on um, in uh, in its infrastructure legislation um, is the type of challenge that I think uh, a project like Ireland 2030 is is answering extremely. Extremely well. I had the pleasure um, for a number of years of serving on the Irish government's Open Data Governance Board, um, where I got to see the kind of the sort of the underlooked work of, um, of of civil servants, but a real interest in the role of data in public debate, in tourism and health and so on, underpinned now by a really significant uh, EU directive um, on on open data and on data sets. Uh, but even this week in the United Kingdom, we see new legislation being promised, which positions data protection itself as a barrier to innovation uh, and argues that the new flexibility available to the UK after Brexit will, will allow for the, for the fostering of of innovation, and it's really on that um, on, on 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 that note that I'll make my last thirty seconds or so of of, of remarks. Um, you know that idea of, of 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 speed and acceleration that we opened with is, is so interesting, and it provokes the most remarkable of debates um, within the within the Marxist intellectual tradition. It's led to a great division. On one hand, the so-called accelerationalists arguing that, um, that 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 capitalism should not be allowed to constrain the productive forces of technology, um, and that there's a difference between state control of data and infrastructure and public control of data and infrastructure, um, which can allow for as some of its most enthusiastic advocates have said for a fully automated luxury communism where the use of technology and automation can transform social and economic relations. On the other hand, critics such as Gavin Muller, the University of Amsterdam, argues that accelerationism has had its time, that now fewer people than ever have faith in the future, a nice happy thought for a morning, um, but Muller contracts, co contrasts sort of what he calls the romantic humanism of critics of technology with what he would prefer, which is a new Luddism, a critique of, technologically, uh, of, of technological change from a, um, from a labour perspective. And so, I finished by, by, by returning to, 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 uh, to, to Otmar Morgenthaler and it's something that actually links Morgenthaler's hot metal machine with today's HTML. Um, because that most beloved of fonts, uh, which many of you may, uh, may be using, um, Helvetica, um, is to this day owned by the corporate successors of Morgenthaler's um, uh, a, a company that developed the, the late 19th century Dynatype. Um, Helvetica is a, a, a great story of, of, of fonts and control limited IP control over 
fonts in many in many countries, but yet still practical control over names and know-how and so on. Um, even the liner type itself uh, was subject to patent protection in the United States, but more limited in, in Canada and led um, then a corporate strategy to uh, to a different place. So if we are to think about um, printing presses, linotypes, and Twitter, we need to get we need to get uh, that story that combines the technological, the legal, and the societal um, uh, impact. And it's not to say that the answers are necessarily found um, by 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 returning to Baltimore of the of the late nineteenth century. But the questions. Um, uh, assist us to uh, to deal with the contemporaneous challenges that we're we're talking about today and some of the things that were are feel very 20th century um in respect of uh, how we plan our cities how we regulate our media have not quite gone away thank you very much Thank you very much, Stahi, for uh, a really stimulating talk and uh, also for, for contextualising uh, some of the, the historical trends and developments and uh, I suppose asking uh, uh, if and how we can or we should interrogate uh, what, what counts as, as innovation and yeah, if everything old is new again or if, if what counts as new has actually been been there before, and you mentioned Marx, uh, and of course, you know, I, I kind of thought of you know Marx's quip that you know history repeating itself, first time as tragedy, second time as farce, and I wonder, you know, your your reference to to Twitter and Trump, where where where, where he would would fit in there, uh, and then also of course talking about uh, uh, or highlighting the importance of infrastructure and how infrastructure is is can either enable or or hinder. Uh, uh, speech and especially public speech and, and counter speech. So uh, let me just see, I, I would encourage again everyone to, uh, who, who wants to ask questions, to put them into the uh, Q&A function. Uh, uh, but perhaps I, I start with, with a question on, on the topic of, of social media and, and, and on, on, on Twitter. Um, do, does it enhance digital citizenship? Does it enhance, does it facilitate uh, counter speech? Does it facilitate uh, democratic speech and, and engagement? Or should we actually uh, uh, seek to, to, to return to the old if we can? It's a, it's a brilliant question. It's not one I can, I, I, I can answer. Um, I think the last couple of weeks of discussion around Twitter in particular are prompted by the question of its ownership and the particular role of Elon Musk. Um, in a way, it, it perhaps speeds up or highlights a debate that we've been having, but perhaps not having in as, uh, in as public a fashion as it deserved, because um, if we think of a concentration of power, but then the, uh, the particular view or political position or corporate strategy of one individual, you know, gets the headlines that it does. Well, that wouldn't be possible without the, the kind of the accumulation of, um, of power and influence that, that took place. I mean, the, the, I suppose there's, a, there's kind of been a slow, arguably, arguably kind of a falling out of love with a Silicon Valley mindset. And that didn't happen, you know, two weeks ago with Elon Musk. Um, but yet there's also been, and I'm sure there the, the panelists from the two fantastic um, campaigning organizations that will be up after the break will will reflect on this, that you know, even those with an interest in speech and freedom and the circulation of ideas, you know, and may have been willing to look the other way when the emerging technological giants were on side. That kind of coalition between advocates for open access and um, uh, uh, and infrastructure and challenging a digital divide with technological companies that were the outsiders, but inevitably are now the insiders. Um, and I think that that itself is probably my I suppose my answer on the on the, on the Twitter point that we see. You know, there are there have been multiple attempts at online speech platforms and. You know, we're we're a decade and a half into Web 2.0, and now we're wondering about Web 3.0 and everything else. But um, the, the, those questions weren't necessarily answered. We allowed a situation to uh, to develop where we thought that 
social media was so disintermediated, you know, it was it would speak truth to, you know, it would allow the speaking of truth to power. It would allow the kind of the editorial filters to be to be removed. And I think the the last couple of years has shown maybe the weaknesses of that from a from a uh, from not just a theoretical perspective but a pragmatic one. Um, but also, you know, the the welcome. That was visited. That was there for certain high-profile removals from social media. Again, reflects um, that the 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 norms and the priorities around unfettered free speech and the extent to which that reflects an American constitutional value value or a universal one, um, which itself intersects with discussion on so-called cancel culture and responsibilities and so on. Um, you know, a lot has changed even in that period as well. So we kind of got ships passing in the night, um, arguably. And I think what we're seeing at the moment. Right, Twitter is a culmination of a, ser a series of anxieties that probably did deserve to be addressed, but they're just all being addressed all at once at the moment. Yeah, thanks. And of course, this also then would, would lead into questions about, you know, how to implement def defamation law when, you know, when, when trying to regulate uh, online speech. Um, there are no further questions coming through in the Q&A at the moment. Uh, but please feel free to post your questions. Um, we are just a little bit running over time, so I just that we take our little comfort break now and that we're all uh, reconvening at um, 11.45 for our second uh, panel this morning when we hear from uh, Dr. Daniel Leufer and uh, Dr. Johnny Ryan. So let me thank again uh, the speakers uh, who presented this morning and uh, um, providing us with, with fascinating insights and, and, and a rich analysis of, of the different dimensions and challenges that uh, emerge and uh, need to be tackled uh, as, as we move forward into Alan 2030 and as we deal with the, with the uh, problems generated and concerns generated by, by the digital age. So I shall, uh, uh, return. I shall see you all again at uh, quarter to twelve and by ten minutes. So thank you very much. Oh, so you're you're all very welcome to our second panel uh, uh, of, of of this event. And uh, for this second session, we have two excellent speakers who are uh, involved in the work of NGOs, digital rights uh, um, campaigns, and who will give us an insight into the work that uh, they're doing as, as part of, of, of their organizations. We'll begin uh, this panel with a presentation by Dr. Daniel Leufer. Dr. Leufer is Senior Policy Analyst at the Brussels Office of Access, now a global digital rights organization. His work focuses on the impact of emerging technologies on digital rights, with a particular focus on artificial intelligence, facial recognition, biometrics, and augmented and virtual reality. And I'm sure we hear a lot about this um, today. While he was a fellow at the Mozilla Foundation, he developed a website which gathers resources to tackle the myths and misconceptions about artificial intelligence. And I've actually put a, a link to this website in the chat. I would encourage everybody to have a look at it. It's, it's a fantastic uh, uh, website and has fantastic resources. Dr. Leifer has a PhD in philosophy from KU Leuven in Belgium, and he was previously a member of the working group on the philosophy of technology, on philosophy of technology, also at KU Leuven. He retains his links with the university where he currently serves as a member of the external advisory board of KU Leuven's Digital Society Institute. And this morning, uh, Dr. Leufer will speak on the topic of surveilled citizenship, human rights, and the governance of artificial intelligence. So I'll hand over to you, Daniel. Great, thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, thanks to Birgit and Finton and all the organizers uh, for putting together what has so far been a really fascinating program. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And despite my Germanic <coughs> surname, I'm actually from Chum. And this is actually the first Irish event I've ever spoken at. So that's something to uh, note down. I'll just share my screen and 
hopefully you should be able to see my slides. Um, is that working? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Um, great. So I guess I'll start with a little introduction to Access Now, uh, the NGO that I work for, um, and then come into the precise topic I want to talk about today. Um, you'll see that the first three or four slides are professionally done by our design team, and then the quality of them will dip significantly when you come to the ones that I put together. Uh, but hopefully they provide a bit of guidance through the topic. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, Access Now is an international NGO working to advance human rights in the digital age. Our mission is to defend and extend the digital rights of people at risk. Um, <clears throat> we focus on five main issue areas, freedom of expression, privacy, digital security, business and human rights, and net neutrality. And our bread and butter and how we started as an organization is a digital security helpline which offers direct technical assistance to civil society, to human rights defenders, journalists around the world free of charge. Um, and I think that's interesting in the context of the topic today on digital citizenship because the policy work that we do is by and large informed by that concrete experience of seeing how digital transformation, how digitization platforms, all of these things <clears throat> impact the ability of civil society, of human rights defenders, of journalists to do their job, which as we all know is essential to democracy and to citizenship. Um, so when, and yeah, just, I mean, uh, I think Birgit gave a, a, the full intro um, on me as well, but I think I was particularly glad for Professor Roseman's uh, very philosophical introduction which I'd like to come back to a bit at the end of my own presentation and maybe just one uh, little thing to add which I'll, I'll try to reflect on a bit is that my own PhD was uh, not on artificial intelligence um, but actually on the philosophy of the Czech Czechoslovakian dissident movement in the 1960s and 70s um, and I think that's particularly relevant for the topic that I want to talk about today which is the sort of interrelationship um, and incompatibility of citizenship and surveillance and how actually forms of surveillance uh, undermine the foundations of democracy, the foundations of the public sphere and the foundations upon which real meaningful citizenship um, can be built. Um, so I'll start by giving a bit of an overview of, of the talk. Um, so when I was first invited and saw the topic, I mean, the thing that came to my mind immediately was how will developments in what we call artificial intelligence, and you can add the scare quotes every time I use that word, um, how will that impact citizenship in the coming eight years? Um, and so that's really, I think, I want to look at how certain trends that we're seeing now, which in certain parts of the world are maybe very prominent in others are emerging, how those are likely to develop. Um, the first part of the talk will maybe be a bit uh, pessimistic, but um, then I'll turn after looking at, you know, this digitization of public space, which we've already heard a lot of great stuff about uh, from the earlier speakers, um, the role of smart cities, smart devices. Um, I'll then look at facial recognition and biometric surveillance, and also emotion recognition and how these two technologies uh, how I would argue that they they really uh, gnaw away at and undermine some essential foundations of democracy and citizenship. Uh, and then turn to maybe more hopeful uh, aspect of the talk with a look at civil society's fight to protect human rights in the context of artificial intelligence um, and finish up with something very concrete, which is the European Union's Artificial Intelligence Act, which we've already heard a bit about, um, but I'll give some updates on where the debate is at now and how we're working very hard to convince policymakers to add improvements in there to make sure that it's actually something that works to protect people's rights. So I think the first thing to talk about is, um, yeah, can citizenship survive surveillance? Um, and when I speak about digitization here, I think, you know, we've heard a lot about all the various aspects of digitization and there's so much to cover that uh, I wouldn't be able to 
to cover it all, but I'd really like to look at the encroachment of these technologies into our public spaces, into essential services, and how that can lead to increased surveillance and undermine these foundations of democratic citizenship. I think the basic idea is that citizenship and democracy are not something we can take for granted. Uh, that certain technological developments pose a threat to the rights, freedoms and institutions that are essential uh, to these. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the work that I did on the Czechoslovakian dissident movement, you know, we saw that you had political dissidents, political activists being literally followed around by secret agents. Everywhere you go, there'd be someone driving after you in their car, walking down the street, following you. Um, and that, as we all know, you know, has an utterly corrosive effect um, on your ability to exercise your rights and freedoms. Um, but what we're seeing now is how technological developments are actually posing a similar threat. And I think in many regions of the world, we see, you know, overt digital authoritarianism, where we have authoritarian governments who are employing digital technologies to make their authoritarianism more effective. Um, but what's, what I'd like to focus on more is how supposedly non-authoritarian states uh, in which Ireland would uh, be an example um, are nevertheless in the use and promotion of these technologies actually undermining the things that uh, you know they hold dear. Um, <clears throat> so I think we, uh, we hear more and more about smart things, uh, whether it's smart watches, smart lampposts. Uh, we heard a lot already about smart cities um, and we hear things about smart public services, proactive public services that uh, do things for you before you even decided you needed them. You know, in uh, Finland, uh, you're offered a crash place uh, as soon as it's something that you needed because it's predicted that you're going to need it at a certain time. Um, and, you know, we, we've all encountered, I think, supposedly very efficient and effective smart chatbots that can answer all our frequently asked questions, but actually just prevent us from ever getting in touch with the real human being who could solve our problem. Um, and there is a joke, which like any good joke has a strong element of truth in it, uh, that whenever you see the word smart, you should read it as surveillance. And that, as we've already heard, is because these devices uh, more and more collect data about us. They collect data, they process it, they store it, they share it. Um, and, you know, your fridge, your runners, all of these devices, the lampposts on the street, there is this tendency that is also presented as inevitable. And we heard some interesting things already about these narratives that are being pushed around technological progress or development, um, which I'll talk a bit about how we're going to push, we, we push back against. How this is perceived as inevitable, that more and more things will become smart, that sensors will proliferate, that more and more data will be collected. And of course, if we have all that data, we have to do something with it. We couldn't let it go to waste. So this is the type of problematic narrative, I think, that we, uh, that we hear a lot about. Um, I will say that it doesn't have to be this way. It's not the case that smart, innovative, uh, technologically uh, enhanced devices have to be surveillance devices. They don't have to hoover up, share all the data that they collect about us, profile us, uh, you know, target ads at us. But the depressing fact is that by and large they do and that there aren't, uh, there isn't an, an incredibly wide range of smart devices out there that are privacy preserving. And where they are, they tend to be luxury products where freedom from surveillance uh, is becoming a luxury good. So, yeah, I think that the general trend um, is that these smart devices, which collectively we could call the Internet of Things, are gathering more and more data about us. The types of data that they collect are becoming more and more invasive. You know, your smartwatch is taking data about your heart rate. Uh, all of these, these types of things, and I'll come back a bit later on to augmented reality and how that could lead to, you know, a whole new depth of of data collection and harvesting. Um, and the way that this 
sort of increase in surveillance devices, increase in data collection in, in all aspects, both of our sort of personal life and the devices that we wear, the wearables, the things we have in our house, but also in our public spaces in terms of smart advertising billboards, Bluetooth beacons in um, shops. As I said, these things collect more and more and more data. And then there's this sort of excuse that, yeah, well, we better do something with it. And that's really where artificial intelligence uh, comes into the question. Um, the question of what is artificial intelligence is not something I want to get into here. But as I said, let's keep the scare quotes around it. Um, and Birgit already uh, kindly referred to the website I put together that um, unpacks a bit some of the ambiguities around this. But I think essentially what you can say is that when we talk about the types of artificial intelligence that are processing these massive amounts of data, we're talking about an approach to AI called machine learning. Machine learning is essentially an approach to AI, which experienced a massive boom in the last 10 to 12 years um, due to a number of reasons, including increased processing power uh, and also the increase in, in the amount of data available. Um, but I think you can see a really stark change uh, in the past, what's a, what's a six years, uh, when this XKCD comic was published, where, you know, in the first one, it's sort of mocking how maybe managers or project leaders in, in companies don't understand how complex an app can be. And, you know, the first one, they say, when a user takes a photo, the app should check whether they're in a park. That's very easy. It could be used. Uh, geolocation data and then it should check if the photo is of a bird and five years six years ago that was extremely complex now as this uh you know rejigging of the the comic suggests it's like that uh object recognition pattern recognition has experienced such progress in the last few years that these type of things are now you know laughably cheap and easy to do with very little knowledge of the intricacies of the, you know the mathematics behind machine learning, uh, you can go onto GitHub, you can download the software, you can do API calls and, and put together a, a sort of a, what 10 years ago was an extremely complex system uh, to do these type of things. Um, I also saw just as an anecdote that uh, I think it was yesterday, Ireland appointed an AI ambassador. Uh, <laughs> so that's another element in the increased hype around this technology. Um, I will say one other thing, which is that although there's been massive progress in some areas of artificial intelligence, and I specifically pointed to pattern recognition there, and that covers everything from recognizing if the photo is a photo of a bird, uh, translation, uh, we all know how good Google Translate and other machine learning based translation services are. Um, but that progress does not actually apply to all applications of AI. And there's a sort of misleading idea that because some aspects of it have gotten better, all of them have. And also a very misleading idea that more data means better predictions, better algorithms. In some cases it does, uh, and in some cases it doesn't. Um, and I'll come back to that in a bit, but like very briefly, what you could say is that these type of simple pattern recognition things, you know, spotting of something as a face, mapping one language to another, are things where a massive amount of progress has been made, but there's also a huge industry and a huge boom in the use of AI to predict very complex social outcomes, attributes, whether a um, person is likely to be committing uh, fraud on child benefits, whether a child is at risk and social services need to intervene, um, whether someone is a suitable candidate for a job. And these are not things that machine learning is actually good at. Uh, quite the contrary, there's been a lot of work and I, I deal with this on the website under the topic of um, machine learning can solve all problems. Uh, these types of very complex predictions, are, machine learning is not actually very good at so far. And uh, there's, uh, you know, very deep philosophical questions about whether as an approach it can really solve these problems. Um, so, as I said, I want to kind of zoom in on a couple of uh, uses of AI, uh, which I think have a particularly corrosive effect on citizenship, on democracy. Um, <clears throat> and foremost among those, I think, is facial recognition and biometric surveillance. I add biometric after because 
facial recognition is what most people talk about but everything you can do with the face you can also do with an ear you can do with maybe the way someone moves their head and biometrics refers to all of these sort of data points about our bodies about how we use our bodies and so it's generally not just limited to faces although i'll stick to the term face because it's it's the most common uh, form that people are familiar with these technologies the first question before i start talking about our work to call for a ban on facial recognition in public spaces is to say what is facial recognition because it's actually an umbrella term and uh, we're not talking about a ban on all forms of it. We're talking about uh, identification specifically and its use in publicly accessible spaces. So very quick uh, overview of what facial recognition is. There's, you know, broadly three to four things that you can do uh, with someone's face um, <clears throat> in an AI system. You can detect, is there a face in the image? Uh, this is like the basic first step. Once you've identified that there is a face in an image, then you can answer questions about it. Um, that's the most simple step in a facial recognition system, but it's not to be taken for granted either, as I'll come back to in a bit. Then, um, you know, the, the most common thing when people hear that we have a campaign to ban facial recognition in publicly accessible spaces, they say, oh, but are you seriously going to ban me from unlocking my iPhone? No, because this is facial verification and we're talking about identification. So verification is what you'd be familiar with from unlocking your phone with your face or from uh, individual airport passport gates where you go, you present your face, scan your, your ID. And then what's done there is the, the system is asked a basic question. Are these two faces the same? Is the face in front of the camera and the face on the passport or the face template on the phone, do they match? If so, then you're authenticated and you're, you know, your phone is unlocked, you're allowed through the gate. Uh, that is not a totally unproblematic use of the technology. There are serious risks around that. Um, but the, the real, really problematic and uh, corrosive to democracy use that I want to focus on is identification. And that's essentially asking the question, does the face that the camera is capturing match a face on a database or a watch list? Um, as opposed to the verification, which is kind of one-to-one -one matching, this is a one-to-many matching. Uh, and this is what you are thinking of when you think of the police having a list of suspects, um, <clears throat> putting, you know, having cameras in publicly accessible spaces and then scanning the face of every single person who walks through those public spaces to see if maybe they match uh, the watch list. This is the technology which essentially destroys anonymity in public spaces. Um, it can be done live. Uh, so police can be have cameras that are capable of checking people as they walk through the spaces, but it can also be done retroactively to go through uh, CCTV footage. Um, and there's a current problematic narrative that the live one is more uh, dangerous to human rights than the retroactive one. And this is absolutely not true. Um, if you think about the retroactive one, if a journalist published a particularly damning report that got some powerful people in trouble, it would be the retroactive use of facial recognition that would be used to go back through CCTV, for example, and track down who their source was. Uh, so that can be used to retroactively see where you were, who you spoke to. So that distinction there is there is a distinction, but it's not one where one is harmful and the other is not. Um, I think one of the key things people know about facial recognition is that it's biased, that it's been shown to be inaccurate. And there's this landmark study from Joy Bulamwini and Timnit Gebru called Gender Shades that showed that uh, at the time it was published, um, the most common facial recognition algorithms were less accurate on people with darker skin, less accurate on women, and then least accurate of all on women with uh, darker skin. And th this is a thing that we see across AI systems. When AI systems fail, you know, maybe they have a 90% accuracy rate. That 10% is never a random 10%. And it's never it includes people like me, white, cishet, uh, males. It's always people who are already marginalized, who are already discriminated against. And I think that's something really important to see behind these figures. We have a 90% accuracy rate, but who's the 10% of people that you failed? Um, now, I think what's interesting is that in our campaign against facial, in, against the use of facial identification, um, 
we have been careful not to focus on the accuracy problem. The accuracy problem is really important. And I mentioned facial detection a while ago, that basic thing, is there a face in the image? If these systems are being used, they should be accurate. They should work well across all demographics. We've seen with um, these AI proctoring services, which I think Afro already mentioned, uh, to check if students are cheating during exams, that uh, darker skinned students, the system was not even recognizing their face. It wasn't detecting their face in the image. And they were forced to shine incredibly bright, hot lights on their faces uh, just to be recognized. So when they are used, they should not be biased. They should be accurate. But I think with, um, facial identification in public spaces, we don't want to perfect instruments of surveillance. We simply don't want mass surveillance. We don't want our public spaces to be turned, you know, to anonymity to be completely removed from public spaces. And that, you know, I, I think Afro already gave a really great overview over this growth of the AI ethics discussion, uh, which I think was largely driven by companies who were saying, no, we don't need regulation. Uh, we have ethical principles that can sort of guide us. But again, as Afro pointed out, the effectiveness of these ethical approaches is seriously questionable. Um, <clears throat> our position, which has gradually become, I would say, the majority position within civil society is that there are uses of AI uh, among which is this facial biometric identification in publicly accessible spaces that cannot be made better by just being made more accurate, that cannot be made better by having ethical principles. Um, there are no safeguards that make them work well. They simply have to be prohibited. Um, and these de-biasing methods, you know, are not the solution always. Uh, I have a bit of an overview here over some campaigns to ban biometric surveillance in the EU. And if you're an EU citizen, please sign the Reclaim Your Face <coughs> uh, campaign. Uh, we have 71,000 signatures uh, to call for a ban. Uh, in Belgrade, in Serbia, there was a really dodgy project um, where the government um, worked with Huawei uh, for one of their safe city projects to put together a, uh, a thousand cameras, literally, in, uh, in Belgrade. Uh, sorry, I went too far on my slides. Um, then globally, Access Now runs the Ban Biometric Surveillance Campaign, of which Birgit is a, a signatory, um, with over 200 civil society organizations from over 60 different countries. Amnesty have banned the scan. Uh, Roskom Swoboda, a partner from Russia, have banned CAM, and in India, partner of ours have Project Panoptic. Um, so that movement to, to call for this ban has been one of the, the big things that I've been working on and a lot of people have been working on the last couple of years and that we think is essential to guaranteeing that our public spaces remain places where we can exercise real citizenship. And as we know, these are essential to well-functioning democracies. Um, I'll go a bit quickly. Um, I've got about four minutes left through the next topic, um, emotion recognition. Essentially, emotion recognition is the use of AI to analyze data about our bodies, about, you know, it can be the way we write, the way that we move our faces to detect our emotional state. And I would put scare quotes around detect there because emotional state is not something you can detect. You have to infer it. So what you can detect is a smile. You can detect that someone smiled or raised their eyebrows or something like that. But then there has to be an inference to the fact that they're feeling an emotion. But as any reasonable person knows, and no, or very few machine learning engineers who produce these things seem to know, there isn't a clear one-to-one -one correlation. You know, you smile uh, maybe just before you punch someone. Uh, you uh, don't. Uh, you don't have that clear one-to-one. -one. You don't always. A smile doesn't mean you're happy. Being happy isn't uh, necessarily correlated to smiling. And the the foundations of this technology have been called into serious question by work like. This article from Lisa Funland Bars and others, um, which basically concluded that there is no solid basis for the types of inferences that these technologies make. Uh, there's been incredibly invasive uses of these technologies. Uh, so, you know, to go to the public spaces example that I was talking about earlier, uh, Lincolnshire Police uh, wanted to trial a system that would go back through CCTV footage to detect aggressive people. Now, emotion recognition systems have been shown to flag. Um, the speech of black Americans as more aggressive than white Americans uh, to even flag pictures of black people as aggressive, even though they're smiling. So you can see clearly the potential for discrimination there. Um, 
in and this is coming more to the uh, aspect that I wanted to talk about, about uh, essential services, public services, private services. Uh, we've seen student surveillance. Intel has just very recently come out with um, a system that it claims is a teaching tool to identify students' emotions. And Zoom, uh, which we're on now, has talked about trialing a use of emotion recognition to detect whether any of you are interested in listening to my presentation or not and other types of things. And we're actually joining a civil society coalition to call for them to not do that. Uh, very problematically, we've seen the use of AI polygraphs uh, at the borders of the EU. There was an EU funded project uh, under Horizon 20 called I, 2020 called I Border Control that was using uh, emotion recognition essentially to detect if applicants for asylum or for border crossing uh, we're telling the truth or not, which again, these systems cannot do that. They are not advanced enough. They're not capable of taking into account all of the intercultural nuances and emotional expression. They tend to be trained uh, very ridiculously on databases of actors portraying emotions rather than real people and also take no account of cultural divergence. Uh, we've also seen smart advertising billboards in publicly accessible spaces. We were involved in a case in Brazil where um, <clears throat> The uh, operators of the metro had smart billboards in place um, that were uh, basically detecting whether or not, um, you know, what emotion you were experiencing what, and your gender to try and serve better ads to, which in itself is a ridiculous proposition and, you know, violates people's rights. And we actually, um, our partners won the case. Uh, so that's some good news. Um, I'll, oh. I somehow went out of my slide. Yeah, um, I'll skip over this last bit just because I'm a bit tight on time, but it goes beyond emotion to biometric categorization. So detecting ethnicity, race, political orientation, sexual orientation, criminality, um, all of these things are, there's machine learning research papers out there. There's people wanting to deploy them uh, and they're all incredibly problematic. And we've been working to push for a ban on some of them. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip the AR bit, but, um, you know, as very briefly, as augmented reality glasses become a thing in, say, the next five years, there'll be the possibility for people to run these types of algorithms on their own glasses and use them on bystanders. So that's something where this could become really a decentralized surveillance panopticon. Um, just for the last minute or two to zoom in on the EU's Artificial Intelligence Act, it, as we heard, it very basically takes a risk-based approach to regulating AI, which is something we were critical of from the beginning, um, and has essentially three risk levels, which is prohibited practices that pose an unacceptable risk to fundamental rights, um, obligations on what are called high-risk systems, which are mostly transparency and reporting obligations, and then transparency obligations for other AI systems, such as deepfakes, chatbots, uh, and emotion recognition. Um, civil society, we've been working in a large coalition, which uh, has included uh, ICCL, uh, who you'll hear from next, um, to push for some key demands, so broader prohibitions, so a real proper ban on facial recognition in publicly accessible spaces, also on uses in the migration context, predictive policing, and some of these really problematic uh, aspects or applications of AI that really undermine the essence of uh, democracy and citizenship. Also for more obligations on entities deploying AI, high-risk AI, more transparency, real rights for affected people, and more flexibility for updating these risk categories um, so that the regulation can stay on top of developments. Um, I'll finish with just one quote and to loop back into the very philosophical intro to the today's conference that we got, that we often hear about the risks of bias, the risks of these systems, you know, miscategorizing certain people, uh, and these are real risks, but I think there's a deeper risk with some of these systems, which is that they're often operationalizing very simplistic theories of human behavior. So, you know, Kate Crawford has pointed out, for example, that the particular theory of that underlies a lot of emotion recognition systems is this basic emotions theory, which is quite an old, fairly outdated theory. 
Uh, and the reason it's been taken up so emphatically in Silicon Valley is that it's easy to translate into machine learning systems. And this is a problem that we see across the board. You have a fairly simplistic theory that categorizes people into neat boxes and is essentially rubbish. Uh, and that becomes what's easy to do with machine learning. And I'll just finish with a quote from Hannah Arendt where she says, the trouble with modern theories of behaviorism, and here I think you can insert any of these theories underlying biometric categorization, emotion recognition, is not that they're wrong, but that they could become true, that they're actually the best possible conceptualization of certain obvious trends in modern society. So it's quite conceivable that the modern age, which began with such an unprecedented and promising outburst of human activity, may end in the deadliest, most sterile passivity history has ever known. So essentially that these systems will start to dictate the way that we behave if we have to perform in a way that is machine readable uh, in public spaces in order to access services, but that will actually have this incredibly pernicious effect uh, on our democracies and on citizenship. Thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel, for a fascinating talk, which uh, uh, I think drove home the, the challenges and indeed the threats that uh, some of these applications and, and their particular uses uh, pose to fundamental rights, uh, to whole communities, uh, to uh, minoritized groups, and, and also to um, citizenship. Um, we, we do have a question, um, and uh, we, we go straight into the, the Q&A. Um, so I've recently heard of an interesting shift from verification to identification in terms of airport automated fast track lanes, where previously participants in the US Canada Nexus program would have to present their ID at a kiosk or to a staff member, and then be scanned to verify they match the ID and let into the fast track lane. Now they walk towards a barrier, their face is scanned, and if it matches an entry in the database, they are let free without having to present ID. I presume there's some cross-checking against active boarding passes to now on the search domain, but it does still shift to the one-to-one, -one, uh, sorry, one-to-many approach. So I, I wonder if, if you want to uh, comment on, on, on that, Daniel. Yeah, thanks. I've seen this as well, and we've been we've actually commented on it because it, it popped up in uh, I think one of the more recent French presidency. Uh, so the text from the Council on the AI Act, they added in a term called authentic verif. It was like some weird combination of authentication and verification to refer to this. Where you're precisely right that this is actually a form of identification, um, and. I think what's happening in these situations is you'd have to pre-register your ID somehow, and then you turn up at the place and you're allowed to walk through, you know, you're scanned. And then if you're scanned and you don't match some sort of pre-registration, you're then not allowed in. This is a form of identification and this does fall under the type of thing that we're asking to ban. And I think maybe to zoom that out into a general trend, what we see is that every time you define something in these spheres in a way that places restrictions on developers on those deploying these systems there's a little slight shift to sort of dodge to the right you know to, to change slightly how they frame the technology so that oh no we're not doing that the most ridiculous example i saw recently was i was on a panel uh talking about the risks of remote biometric identification in public spaces and someone from uh company assured me, oh, but we solved that problem. It's not an issue. We don't use any biometric data. We use radar to scan your skeleton somehow. So there's no risk of bias because there's no skin color, whatever anymore. Uh, and, th and then we identify you like that. And it, it just encapsulated the ridiculousness of the approach. To, we don't want you to identify people in public spaces. There are problems with the way it's done through facial recognition, but the fundamental problem is not the system not working well. It's not the system being inaccurate or biased. It's what it intends to do. And that's the, the essence, I think, of when we've been calling for prohibitions, when, you know, you can call for safeguards when if a thing is done wrong, it could lead to serious violations. But when the very essence of what the system is trying to do is in complete conflict with the essence of the right, then there's no solution but to prohibit it. And that's, again, coming back to this narrative that, um, 
it's not the case that we're going to eventually have to adopt all of these technologies. That, that is not an inevitability and we need to have much more imagination about what the future can look like here. The future can be that we just don't uh, undermine anonymity in publicly accessible spaces and that becomes a sort of selling point or an advantage of, uh, of living in the EU or hopefully uh, in more places. Yeah, I mean, so there's another question here, uh, I think on, oh, sorry, it's come through in the chat. Um, um, so the question is whether you could comment on the lack of remedies in the AI Act and the implications of this, given our experience with the lack of enforcement of remedies in the GDPR, uh, you know, referring back to Ola's presentation this morning and Ola already outlined uh, some of some of the challenges there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely, this was one of the big uh, issues that we highlighted with the AI Act when it came out, that there was no rights uh, accorded to individuals. Um, and thankfully, there has been movement on that. So the two lead committees in the parliament, IMCO and LIBE, uh, put out their draft reports uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they did include rights to redress and right to lodge a complaint with an authority. We're pushing for, you know, broader rights than that. But uh, yeah, the enforcement issue is the really big, big outstanding issue. And talking to policymakers, they're also like, please send good suggestions for the enforcement because, you know, learning the lessons. And I'm sure uh, we have the one of the big experts on enforcement issues with the GDPR coming up next. So we'll hear a lot about it. Um, I think that's that's a huge issue. Maybe what I can say is that we're looking at the AI Act really not as an ideal piece of legislation. Uh, we're looking at it as how can we improve this to make the very poor state of affairs and status quo better? You know, how can we empower, and I, I think, I don't know if it was Afra or Orla that mentioned it um, earlier, how can we empower activism so that people can lodge complaints, so that, you know, a civil society organization like Algorithm Watch, who do this amazing report every year that says what AI systems are in use in, uh, in Europe, don't have to do that because there's a public database that says all of the AI systems that are in use. Uh, and so, you know, basically takes that initial burden of knowing what's in use, basic information about it and creating reporting channels. But in terms of actually stopping really harmful practices, uh, I think I don't have a huge amount of hope in the AI Act uh, to do that. And then we have time for just one last question. Uh, <clears throat> very quick answer. Uh, can you give some examples of risks to rights for those for whom the AI facial identification will probably be accurate? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think there was a, a really good um, article from an author, and I forget her name now, she was involved, a uh, Black Lives Matter activist, who said, like, I actually, please keep facial recognition inaccurate on Black people because I don't want to be recognized at protests. And, you know, it's tongue in cheek, uh, because obviously there's serious harms to being misrecognized as well. And we've seen that in the US where uh, <clears throat> Black people have been misrecognized and arrested on that basis. But the, the real harms really, really come for the majority of people from actually being identified. Like we just had a communication from a Russian uh, civil society partner there that people who took part in the uh, anti-war protests uh, when going through the metro were just apprehended uh, like a week later, uh, you know, before the, the Victory Day. Uh, parade. So they were taken before they even entered the place and just apprehended. And they are people, you know, for whom the technology works perfectly well. And it, it's back to that thing again. It, it's not the technology malfunctioning that's the issue. It's the fact that it's actually doing what it intends to do. And that is, is a completely insidious thing, you know, removing your identity in public spaces or, you know, emotion recognition as well, I think, doesn't really work. It's it's shoddy. It's based on dodgy premises. But if it did, and Susie Allegra has, you know, been great on this, she said, we really need to regulate these things on the basis of what they say they can do, not on the fact, you know, her, she was talking about Cambridge Analytica specifically, like it probably didn't work and was overselling what it could do. But let's regulate it on the basis of what they're claiming they can do, because if a technology could actually 
tell what my real emotions are, whether I'm being deceptive. That is such an egregious violation of so many rights, including, and this is Susie Allegra's work as well, freedom of thought, um, that it absolutely needs to be banned. And then we can't have systems out there that are <clears throat> claiming to do this, if they're, even if they work perfectly. Yeah, I think uh, Woodrow Hartsock referred to facial recognition technology as a menace disguised as a gift. And I think that description fits the, the, the whole range of biometric technologies. Daniel, thanks again for a fascinating talk. And we're, we're swiftly moving on to our final presentation today, which will be delivered by Dr. Johnny Ryan. Uh, he is a senior fellow at the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, a senior fellow at the Open Markets Institute. Dr. Ryan's work focuses on surveillance, data rights, competition and antitrust, as well as privacy. He has been described very deservedly, in, 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 in my view, as a renowned uh, global privacy expert. The Berlin Daily Der Tagesspiegel listed him as one of the digital people who shaped 2021. The German Weekly Die Zeit called him Google's biggest headache. And the tech newsletter, The Protocol, referred to him as the thorn in Google's side. Uh, Dr. Ryan currently has litigation and regulatory proceedings in several jurisdictions. So I'll hand over to Dr. Ryan. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm going to start um, by attempting to share my screen. Let's see how that goes. Okay, you should see my screen. It should be very unexciting and gray. And now you should see my email address. Can you see that, Birgit? Let me know. Yes, yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, this morning, I'm gonna play a clip, it's three seconds. So before you see it, I want you to know what you're about to see. This morning, the European Parliament had a debate on the AI Act. And in that debate, a prominent um, Green member of Parliament, as it happens, said the following, three second clip, here it is. Considering the lessons learned, we can't have Ireland alone supervising our tech laws again. Considering the lessons learned, we can't have Ireland supervising our tech laws again. And she's speaking as a European on behalf of all Europeans. Now, that is the end point of my presentation over the next 25 or so minutes. I'm going to go back to the beginning and then bring it back to the end. First, <clears throat> I'll tell you about my own journey. Well over a decade ago, I wrote a history of the internet and the digital future. And this was a beautifully utopian book. <laughs> I thought everything was going to be wonderful. I've been on a long and winding road since then. And I now work for the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. And what we're working on, among other things, are the problems of the digital world, the problems that I did not see coming. Let me pick four of them to speak about. And then I'll focus on one of them because time does not allow for the full awfulness to be engaged with. First, algorithmic discrimination. And this is something that uh, we've just heard about. The idea that there will be systems that shape our world and deep within them is a bias. The second problem is the collapse of the journalistic industry, often because its audience is being stolen. And I mean that in a data sense, and it is being crushed by um, arbitrage. Third, the manipulation of elections, micro-targeting, nudging, etc. And fourth, the threat to personal autonomy, which is implicit in all of these things. And this leads us to dystopia. Now, <laughs> you should perhaps by now be thinking at this stage of the morning about E.M. Foster and the machine stops and Butler and so on. And that's exactly, I think, appropriate. I want to focus on just one of our fights at ICCL, just one of them, but I want to take this time to go into a bit of detail in that fight. And it gives an indication of the kind of work we're doing and the kind of world we might be shaping for ourselves, and that's not a positive thing. What I want to talk about is the web and app data breach. It's called real-time bidding. Now, for me to describe this to you, actually what I have to describe is how an ad turns up on a web page. 
So let's imagine you visit a website. It could be RTE or the Irish Independent or the Irish Times, where once I used to work too. Now, when you go to a website or an app, the editorial content is loaded up in front of you into your web browser. And there's an empty rectangle, perhaps many, which will contain an ad. Now the website or app will tell one or more auction, known here as an ad exchange, about you, descriptive things about you, so that these companies who are representing prospective advertisers can decide whether to make a bid on the opportunity to put their ad in front of you in that one rectangle. Now, what this does in theory is it means the right advertiser will find you as a prospect, will know enough about you and learn enough about you to decide that they should put their particular ad in front of you on a particular website or app. And this idea has engaged the imaginations of marketers for the last decade. They're very excited about it. They spend a very large amount of money on it every year. One of the problems, there are many, one of the problems is that we have no idea what happens to the data once they leave the publisher or the website. No idea at all. We don't know whether any of these companies hold on to the data and build a profile about you based on what you're doing online, or whether they pass the data on to other people to do other things with them. What we can know about every so often is the results of an investigation into one or other of these companies. So let's pick one of these companies that received people's data through this system, which is responsible for showing ads on most of the internet today. This company is called Vectory. It's absolutely tiny in industry terms. It had three and a half million turnover in the preceding year. And yet, when in 2018, the French enforcer, the Keneal, investigated Vectory, they found that the company had hoovered up 67.7 .7 million people's data just by receiving these requests for the opportunity uh, uh, to, sorry, re requests for bids to have ads shown. So just by sitting in on these auctions, this company Vectory, and it was one of thousands, got to see information about what people were looking at and where they were. Now, if you go to Vectory's website, this is the nonsense claim that you will see. Privacy is hard coded in our DNA. But as you scroll down that web page, you'll see that actually they make a better claim than many of their peers in the industry. They say they only hold on to 30% of the data, and after 12 months, they delete everything. The only reason I mention that, the only reason I draw to your attention is to say that it's entirely possible that this one company, one of hundreds or thousands, who's so small that its turnover was three and a half million turnover in the preceding year, may have actually hoovered up a quarter of a billion people's data in the space of 12 months. We just don't know. So let me show it to you again, the process where if you're incredibly courageous, you might venture onto a dangerous thing called the web or the internet. Here it is slowed down. You visit the website. The website contacts its ad server, which contacts a supply side server, which sends a request for bids for your attention to at least one auction. That's called an ad exchange. One of the companies that receives information about you makes the winning bid. Maybe others made bids too. Now there may be multiple auctions for one ad, so although this is an awful lot of arrows you're seeing, there may be an awful lot more arrows too. I do not expect you to really look at this graph and think, okay, I understand that. What I expect you to do is look at that graph and think that is a lot of arrows. <laughs> so the question is, what is in those arrows? What's in a bid request? We can know what's in a bid request because the industry has been entirely clear on what can be in a bid request. There are two technical standards, one drafted by the IAB, that is the Global Tracking Industries Trade Body, and the other drafted by Google, which has its own system, a variant of the IAB system. They are both very, very similar. Now, what I'm showing you here is the front page of the most recent document that an engineer would use, the rules that an engineer would use to know how to work in this system. 
Now I'm going to scroll through this document to the very end. It's about 14 or 15,000 words. And I'm going to show you an example of a bid request, an example of what's in those yellow arrows. And I'm going to go through this line by line because I want it to be clear. But before I do, all of these broadcasts about what we're all doing online may have much more information than you're seeing here. That's the first thing. As we go through this line by line, we see the URL. Now that's embarrassingwebsite.com. Often you'll have the entire URL, embarrassingwebsite.com slash very compromising category of article slash excruciatingly embarrassing article. <laughs> that's the full URL. Now we've got identifiers about this one individual. You'll notice how many characters, how long these IDs are. They're far longer than your PPS number, your social security number. These are about this one person and they can identify that person when they're seen again on the internet. Now we see we're dealing with a young lady born in 1990, more identifiers about her device and more information about her iPhone 6S so that we could guess it was her if we saw her again, even if we didn't have the identifiers. And in the IAB version of this, not in Google's version, you get her GPS coordinates, shockingly. In Google's version, you get what they call hyperlocal coordinates. Now, this is a lot of information about a person and what they're currently looking at online, but it's not all. In the IAB system, you can also have a guesstimate of what the person is reading about. Now, after pressure from uh, myself and some others, this particular set of terms, most of them, I think, have been removed. But up until quite recently, it was okay in the industry to say IAB 7 28 refers to a person who shows an interest in support for sexual abuse. That's the industry we're dealing with. Now, what happens to these arrows? Where do the data go? and now start thinking about dystopia. The industry's own documents say thousands of companies may receive the information from a single ad being served. And the same document says there is no way to control what happens to the data. Now that is a textbook almost definition of a data breach. So the question then is what's the scale of this data breach? Let me show you a third and final time what this process is. Johnny goes on to thedailybugle.com. The Daily Bugle has an empty ad space. Information about Johnny is sent to two, in this case, auctions, and each auction requests bids from lots of potential bidders. Those companies are called DSPs, by the way. I want to give you a sense of the scale here. Let's take a look at a single ad exchange, just one of them. We are now looking at one of the policy documents of one ad exchange. It's called Xander. We're scrolling through 156 pages. It's a list of all of the companies that Xander says it is allowed to hand information to about where you're standing and what you're looking at online today. There are 1,647 companies in that list. And Xander, which until December was owned by AT&T, was just bought by Microsoft. Xander's only one, as I said, there are many. And judging by their own marketing material, we are talking about hundreds of billions of these broadcasts, of these data leaks every day. So this is a data breach. What does that mean? We know people are looking at us. We know they build profiles about us, but we can't really see what those profiles are, except that we can. In our evidence for our litigation, this is among the materials that we have contributed and we have given it to enforcers who've done nothing with it previously too. The IAB, the tracking industry, celebrated the entry into force of the GDPR or into effect, I should say, of the GDPR in May 2018 by releasing this document, the audience taxonomy. This document is the Rosetta Stone that allows data brokers who sell to each other and to others profiles about us. It's the Rosetta Stone that allows them to synchronize what they know about us. And let's take a look at some of the almost 2000 things that they say is okay to know about us. Here is an example. It's a very long list of traits and behaviors. 
including your religion. Are you Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, etc.? Do you have an interest in mental health, infertility, weight reduction, STDs, and even are you the parent of a child who has special needs? Because if you are, the industry says the code for you is 357. What are your political views? And just to be clear about the caliber of mind we're dealing with here, <laughs> the typos are real. <laughs> and what's your income? How much do you have on your mortgage? Where do you work? And so on. Are you in debt? Bankruptcy. So these are highly, highly intimate things, right? Drugs, marijuana use, gambling, bail bonds. And this isn't just from online advertising. It's from the sum total of what the data broker industry can build around uh, about you. So let's take a few minutes and talk about the law. The beautiful thing about the general data protection is that the short version of the title kind of says what it's about. It's about protecting data. It's nice and straightforward. Now that is given a little bit more form in Article 51F. You are not supposed to have a data breach. That is what this article says. It's a key principle of data protection, protect the data. Now, before the GDPR, um, in 2017, before it was applicable, the industry wrote to the European Commission. I have this document under freedom of information. And it said, we have no idea where the data about someone goes in our industry. It's a big free for all <laughs> of people's secrets. So we will not really be able to ask people for their consent. Now, this was an attempt to lobby for some sort of exemption or carve out in another piece of European regulation called the e-privacy regulation. It's a testament to very, very poor lobbying on the part of the tracking industry. But having conceded that consent could never work for data free for all, the following year, the industry then produced these consent messages, which have plagued us for the last four years. Now, ICCL, um, leading a, a, a group of complainants, finally has had this outlawed in a decision from 28 enforcers led by the Belgian Data Protection uh, Authority on the 2nd of February. And the industry is now a, appealing against that in court and actually will, will be against them in court um, later this month. And this question of enforcement and how hard it was to get to this point leads to the second part of what I want to discuss with you. What I've shown you <clears throat> in this brief presentation about real-time bidding, the online advertising system and its enormous data breach, was the subject of detailed evidence and a complaint that I lodged with the Irish Data Protection Commission on the 12th of September, 2018. And a lot of time has passed since then, an awful lot of time. In fact, I have to update this slide because it's well over 1,300 days since that complaint. And as far as I know, they haven't actually progressed it. They have, they say they have produced things, but the issue remains. And we're still waiting for any sign that our enforcer is going to take action. In this case against Google, which is the largest offender here. Now, the reason I say this is that there is a but in data protection. There are many domains and competition, I think, is, 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 is a particularly important one as well. There are many domains that will determine whether we slide into dystopia. And data protection, I think, is a primary one. When Europe created the GDPR, it told the world that it was serious and the world believed it. I remember I was working in industry. In fact, I was testifying at the US Senate on something similar. And the, and the questions that I was being asked in industry and by lawmakers and so on was, are the Europeans serious about this new data protection law, the GDPR? Or is it just something that they're going to talk about but never enforce? And as a European, I thought, no, Europe is serious. This goes, this is, core to fundamental values in Europe, and Europe's serious about this. But actually, there is a problem. When you take a look, and we're using here 
something called IMI data. It's a system that European enforcers use to coordinate cases, to inform each other of what's happening. When you take a look at the first three years of the GDPR, this is the period for which I have data, of course, an awful lot of the, the complaints are sent to Ireland, right? Because Ireland is the place where the big tech firms by and large are based. You can see this on the map. So Ireland has a huge role, but when you take a look at the actual decisions, and I, by decisions, I mean draft or so-called final decisions that go to the board of enforcers across Europe, you see that first Ireland has a really big case backlog because it's, it's been put in this position where it has this big role. But second, very, very few decisions in that period, the first six years had actually been delivered. Now, what isn't included here are so-called amicable resolutions, where if one individual has an issue with a big company and the big company solves that problem for that individual, fine, it, it doesn't necessarily in Irish law need to go to a final decision. But what we're talking about here are big structural things that need to be fixed at European level. Now, we happen to be litigating against the Irish Data Protection Commission on this very point. But also, we're kind of getting to a crunch time now. In fact, I'm speaking to you midway through the final week for the European Commission. The European Ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly, has written to Ursula von der Leyen um, on foot of our complaint to ask the European Commission what is going on with Ireland's application of European data protection law. And specifically in that letter in February, what information have you at the European Commission used to form a view that Ireland is actually upholding its responsibilities? And the deadline for a response is, funnily enough, this Sunday. So next week, we should have an update. And I think the European Commission and the Irish Data Protection Commission and government will find themselves under pressure to finally start moving cases in a serious way. We await the outcome for that. Um, I'm going to, um, to stop talking now and just hint that if in Q&A um, there's an interest in discussing the role of competition and power, that might be an interesting way to continue the conversation, but I leave it to you. Thank you, Birgit. Thank you very much, Ryan, for, uh, sorry, Johnny, for, for a really, really interesting uh, talk. Frightening in, in, in some way uh, when we consider the amount of data that is being collected about us as, as we go about our living our digital lives, uh, conducting our work um, on online. Um, and uh, also, of course, uh, uh, tapping into uh, this, this really problematic role of, of the Irish Data, data Protection uh, Commissioner, uh, which uh, you, you have highlighted and which has received an, an enormous lot of uh, media attention um, over, over the last... And I should say on that, Birgit, we, we do see the Irish DPC playing an important and useful role on things like whether the Gardaí should have all of the surveillance powers that they say they want. <clears throat> so things are happening. The problem is with big tech. And that is where actually Ireland and our enforcer has a role to play for all Europeans. And the last time I was at the RAA was a long time ago. And I, if I recall, the focus of that discussion was Noel Dorr, the veteran Irish diplomat talking about Ireland as a good citizen of the world. The little boat that needed firm rules and firm rules to be abided by because otherwise it would be toppled on the high seas. We don't seem to be thinking that way when it comes to the digital world. We're, we're very far away from Frank Aiken. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you suggested that you would like to perhaps address the issue of, of competition uh, and competition law. Uh, and I know that this is a particular interest of yours. And I was just wondering if you could tell us maybe a little bit more, more about it, uh, where, where, how you would like to see competition law develop 
and what role competition law could play specifically in the Irish states where we have this concentration of big tech companies? Well, <clears throat> um, I have many a slide on this topic, but I will spare you. Um, Orla made it very clear a few years ago, data is power. We have a situation where if you are a big company, you get big so-called on the merits in a particular market. Let's imagine that Birgit and Johnny start delivering pizza across, across Europe by drone and Europeans fall in love with cold pizza. So drone pizza becomes a big company. We now have data about people's diets, their credit cards, where they live, when they're together in parties, for example. And Birgit, if, if next year you decide we're going to get into the taxi or ride hailing business, we will of course take every bit of data we got from our drone pizza business and drop it into our taxi business. We will, if we became a monopoly in market one, we will cascade that monopoly into another line of business or another market. Now that is what you see with Google, Amazon, Facebook, you name it. They, they get big on the merits because they've got good products in some areas, and then they drop all that data into other areas too. And that's clearly a competition issue, but it's also clearly a data protection issue because the other thing I'm describing there is an internal data free-for-all. The online advertising system is a, is a data free-for-all among thousands of companies. But when one company, which should know what it is doing with your data for one particular purpose, and this is the purpose limitation principle that Orla mentioned, is actually operating an internal data free-for-all. That means all bets are off. Now, there was a story recently that Alexa, Amazon's voice assistant, voice assistant, had been trialing um, a, an, an app or a, a scheme where you could tell it how you felt your symptoms every day, just in general, <laughs> and it would form a record of that. <laughs> now, for example, what happens when Amazon gets into insurance? The internal data free-for-all becomes a real problem. And you can also imagine um, that when you have these internal data free-for-alls and you start thinking about political manipulation, the same problem arises. So uh, that's an unbelievably poor summary of, um, of what I think might be one of the essential issues. The final thing that I might say is, we have just in Europe finalized the negotiations on the Digital Markets Act. And the Digital Markets Act was intended to put manners on the big tech firms, the so-called gatekeeper firms. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. But here's the problem. Not only do we have very, well, no real enforcement uh, of substance that I've seen anyway, um, on data protection law from Ireland, but we also don't have pressure from the European Commission on Ireland, and that is the Commission's job. Now, the DMA and the Digital Services Act put authority at the European Commission level instead of putting it at the, the member state level, as the AI Act will do as well, because Ireland blew its chance to be the center of, of all things digital under the Digital Services Act and the AI Act because of how it has handled the GDPR. But we shouldn't be confident that the European Commission will necessarily do better. If, if there was any sign that the European Commission's competition arm, for example, had any sense of what was going on in the digital market, we wouldn't live in the world we currently live. They have had two decades to not get us to where we are. <laughs> and they've had four years to try to compel Ireland to do its job. And the same for Luxembourg too, because it oversees Amazon. So <clears throat> we have um, three layers of failure. There's the enforcer, there's the government, which is actually responsible, just as it's responsible for its courts. And there's the commission. And none of the three are actually doing their job. And that is why groups like us have to go directly to court. Thanks, uh, Johnny. We have... Um one other question coming in here. Um, so I tend to think of GDPR in relation to big tech companies. 
What about large pharmaceutical companies, state players, and GDPR? So what's, what's the role of GDPR there in terms of data protection? The same as it is for any other entity. Um, as far as pharma goes, I don't know. Uh, I'm focusing on, and we are focusing on a few big problems. Um, and the biggest problems we can see uh, lead us towards digital dystopia. There may or may not be problems in pharma as well, I don't know. On the state side, um, uh, we have had scandals over things like the public services card. It's kind of the data version of Irish water. <laughs> uh, and in that, actually, the Data Protection Commission did play its role. So on the state side, you see far more robust, I would say, adversarial, usefully adversarial um, roles being played by the Data Protection Commission. We're not really seeing that with big tech. Mm -hmm. Okay, one final question, and you already um, hinted at it in, 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 in your response just then now. Um, what has been your experience of engaging with, liaising with Irish legislators, Irish policymakers, and how responsive are they to the suggestions and the proposals that, that come from the ICCL? And I can see if you're happy enough to take one other question, yeah, yeah, yeah. is there a way to block the information sharing ways, to, for example, blocking cookies? Uh, I've got bad news for you, Sylvia, but we'll we'll get to that next. <laughs> On the Irish um, legislator, you know, I were my role is a global one. Um, it's not that I don't talk to Irish legislators. I do, of course, and we had a, a hearing on on these issues um, in uh, April last year. And the Oireachtas Justice Committee produced an important report, which has so far been completely ignored um, by the Data Protection Commission. In fact, remarkably, the Data Protection Commission, I think, claimed that that report is now redundant. <laughs> I, I don't understand. Um, but to give you a sense of what we're doing, last Friday I was testifying um, at the California new privacy uh, authority and had a small role to play in, in their new privacy law. And most of my efforts over the last few months have been in Brussels or in other member states. Um, the rules here are European rules. Uh, global rules matter too. Um, and on the AI Act, for example, on the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, um, you know, we've been advising MEPs and the Commission and other member states and testifying as well. Um, Irish politicians, uh, when these issues crop up, um, you know, I, I, I think they have a well-developed concern about them. They're not comfortable with any of this and they want to see us do better. Um, but actually there's a technocratic conversation that is had in Brussels largely um, behind the scenes. Uh, and at the moment on the Digital Markets Act, for example, the issue is how will the European Commission implement this new set of, of rules? And everything relies on that question. Now, Sylvia asked whether um, it's possible to protect yourself from the system I've just shown you. Yes, it is, uh, to an extent. You can protect yourself from real-time bidding. I used to work for a, a private web browser called Brave. Uh, the, the guy I worked for was the guy who invented JavaScript. It was a Silicon Valley company. And that's a, a free browser, you can use it. I find it useful, I still use it, even though I don't work for the company. Um, ultimately though, the issue is not this one problem that I showed you, we work on several, they will all terrify me. The issue is not that you, Sylvia, should protect yourself, but that we as citizens created a law and the law created supervisory authorities whose job it is to proactively investigate these things, not wait for me to tell them, and then proactively stop them, not wait for me to take them to court. And that's where we are. <laughs> so people like Sylvia should not have to think about how to protect themselves. Unfortunately, they do. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. I just read um, Afra's comment on on um, some of the, the things that you said. Uh, Ireland does not have a very strong history in enforcing media concentration regulation and that academics who've tried to investigate it have received legal letters from media owners. Uh, it's ironically getting data on corporate market shares is becoming even more difficult, even as data gathering on, on users explodes. And I think that's that's a, a really good comment uh, to to finish finish up on. So thanks very much, Johnny, for for your you. excellent presentation and and for for responding to our questions. Uh, it is up to me now to bring the session to a conclusion. So first of all, all on, on behalf of, of my colleague Fintan, Fintan de Bruyne and myself, I would like to thank all our panel speakers for providing us with such excellent presentations, such stimulating uh, talks and, and challenging us to think about uh, digital citizenship and digital governance and to, to encourage us to reimagine uh, what Ireland 2030 could look like. Uh, so I think uh, all of our speakers deserve a round of digital applause. Um, I would also like to thank the audience for engaging with, with the panelists and, and with the event. And uh, I, I sincerely hope that we can continue this conversation in, in perhaps a different format. Uh, this, is, this conversation is, is by no means uh, over. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Philip, Philip Rosenman for initiating the event series and for driving the development and, and the planning and the implementation of the event. And of course, Vanessa Carswell from the Royal Irish Academy for steering us through, through the planning and implementation process and for making today's event and all the other events happen. Um, can I just, before we, we, we all leave, uh, invite everyone to join us uh, this time next week again at 9.30 for a panel on sustainability and then for the final panel in, in a fortnight on the role of the state. So thanks again for everybody who, who was, was here today and uh, ha have a good day. I hope you enjoyed the, the event. Thank you very much. <laughs>